And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson, to speak to and to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to open this debate on Scotland's city region deals and emerging regional economic partnership inspired by them. Uh, not every community in Scotland is in a city region. That is why the Scottish Government wants to ensure that every part of Scotland benefits from investment through a city region or regional growth deal. We continue to press the UK Government to join us in common purpose on this by making a formal commitment to 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals and agree a clear timetable to achieve that goal. Despite encouraging noises from some UK Government Ministers, we await a formal and unequivocal commitment to achieve 100% coverage. I'm sure communities in Shetland, Orkney, the Western Isles, Agil and Butte and Falkirk will support my continuing to press the Secretary of State for Scotland on this very issue. These are the areas yet to secure UK Government commitment to formal dialogue leading to a growth deal. Over the past four and a half years, the Scottish Government has committed almost £1.3 billion to city region deals. And our regional partners in the public, private and tertiary education sector have identified significant levels of complementary investment. It has to be said that we have worked with the UK Government in partnership on the city region deals. Like many collaborations, it has not always been easy. However, I want to accentuate the positive by saying that the combined investment both governments are going to make over the next two decades has massive potential to enable broad economic opportunity and greater societal equality. This investment in city region and other growth deals, when combined with their broad complementary action to drive inclusive economic growth, is going to be crucial if we are to protect and develop the Scottish economy as it navigates the uncertain waters made turbulent by Brexit. In today's debate, uh, linked to prospects for inclusive economic growth in Scotland, it's not credible to ignore the damage and damaging backdrop fuelled by the UK Government's continued inept handling of Brexit. However, at the same time, we must continue to pursue every means open to us of growing Scotland's economy. Senior Officer, I now want to turn to the early impact that our city region deals are having. City region deals represent an important catalyst in helping to drive inclusive growth in Scotland. Deals for all of Scotland's city regions have now either been agreed or reached the stage of a heads of terms agreement between both governments, local authorities and regional partners. This is an important milestone. However, we now want to press forward with implementation of these deals and agree heads of terms for deals covering Ayrshire, Murray and Borderlands, as well as those parts of Scotland I've already highlighted as awaiting a formal commitment to dialogue from the UK Government. Making swift progress towards agreement of heads of terms for all of these regional growth deals will be a Scottish Government priority for 2019. All of our regional partners can be assured that I will persist in my dialogue with the Secretary of State for Scotland on agreeing a clear timetable for achievement of 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals. The city region deals need to be given time, of course, to mature because a before a full assessment of their impact can be made. However, there are certain projects and activities that point to the huge potential the city region deals have in driving inclusive growth across Scotland. Through the Inverness and Highland deal, homes being built with technology to monitor the well-being of their residents, directly addressing some of the growing healthcare challenges which we face. The Oil and Gas Technology Centre in Aberdeen has just this month launched the National Decommissioning Centre in conjunction with Aberdeen University, cementing 
Scotland's international reputation as a centre for decommissioning expertise. The focus on data-driven innovation within the Edinburgh and South East Scotland deal is complemented by investments in skills and economic infrastructure that will ensure Edinburgh's status as the data capital of Europe will have a positive impact on the whole of the region. And the Glasgow City Region deal, canals and North Gateway project will enable inclusive growth by making radical improvements, including new bridges, road access and public realm upgrades, all of which is enabling the creation of new communities within the city. So, and also, before I move to discuss regional economic partnerships, I want to touch briefly on some of the complementary actions we are taking to drive inclusive growth. Our economic strategy sets out our vision for sustainable and inclusive growth. Last October, we published an evolving economic action plan that reinforces our commitment to that vision. There are some new key actions uh, worth highlighting that will help Scotland remain both competitive and fair in future, complementing the city-region deal approach. These include responding to the changing skills needs of business and employees. We work with unions and employers' organisations through the new National Retraining Partnership to deliver a public and private sector response to this. And we'll use public procurement to create more opportunities for Scottish businesses, including increasing the level of digital transactions and digital invoicing to focus on faster payments. These examples of fresh action build on crucial work already in train, such as establishing, uh, the establishment of the Scottish National Infrastructure Bank and the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. The National Infrastructure Mission, announced in this year's programme for government, will see Scotland's annual infrastructure investment steadily increase until it is £1.5 billion higher by the end of the next parliament than in 2019-20. General Officer, members will recall that the Phase 2 report of our Enterprise and Skills Review, published in 2017, we made it clear that the economic power and potential of Scotland's distinct regions needs to be fully harnessed. Partnerships, arrangements for the city-region deals are now inspiring regional economic partnership arrangements. In the northeast of Scotland, the regional economic strategy and action plan developed by local authorities, the private sector opportunity North East partnership and other representatives uh, offers a very positive development. This partnership, inspired by the Catalyst City Region deal, has harnessed the resources available to all partners and established a clear focus on sustaining and creating high value employment and other tangible benefits for people and communities in the northeast of Scotland. The developing Glasgow City Region had its first regional partnership meeting last October. This has evolved from four years of partner dialogue driven by the city region deal. The partnership brings local authorities together with government agencies, the private sector and others to develop region-wide approaches to key interlinked inclusive growth issues such as economic inactivity, driving business growth and crucial challenges such as child poverty. At their heart, Regional economic partnerships are collaborations, providing our democratic elected local authorities with an opportunity to engage the wider public, private and third sector in an action-focused way. The Scottish Government is interested in what it can do to help local authorities, partners achieve uh, as much as they can through these particular partnerships, as opposed to being overtly focused on issues of governance or being prescriptive about the work that they should undertake. The Scottish Government seeks to be conversant in what regions need are in relation to inclusive growth, but we also want to focus 
on our role as investor and enabler of change driven by local and regional partners. This is the way that we have approached our city-region deals. Good governance and the involvement of key partners, such as business, is crucial. But we are primarily interested in the results regional partnerships can achieve on a spectrum of key issues, such as smart infrastructure development, creation of new jobs, and modernization of our skills base. So, and also before I move to my closing remarks, I want to mention at the Local Government and Communities Committee inquiry into city-region deals. The committee's report made a number of recommendations which we continue to work through with our colleagues in the UK government. One example is my continued pursuit of agreement of a timetable with the UK government for rollout of a growth deal covering every part of Scotland. I'm more happy to give way to the member, yes. John Lamond. 11 minutes into the Cabinet Secretary's speech, he's yet to make any comment whatsoever on the key project, which is the Glasgow Airport link. Is he going to make a commitment to uh, the Labour amendment, which says this needs to be progressed urgently? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, as I mentioned here in the Chamber uh, just the other week there, I've got a meeting next week with the key parties on that particular issue, and we'll look to make progress with it at that particular uh, meeting then. General Officer, my former Cabinet colleague Keith Brown identified a passage in the committee's report at a debate in this chamber last March. The report urged both governments to avoid, and I quote, artificial boundaries of what is a reserve project and what is a devolved one, and the badging of who is funding what. I think that recommendation remains very wise. A joint 50-50 investment in high quality, uh, locally developed projects will exhilarate economic growth in a way that improves regional and national prosperity while reducing inequality. I'm aware that Audit Scotland has commenced work to assess the impact of city, region and other growth deals. And Audit Scotland colleagues will receive the full assistance of the Scottish Government in taking this work forward. So, I'd like to draw my opening remarks to a close by now make, highlighting three points. Firstly, we have committed almost £1.3 billion to city region deals and want to commit more in order to work towards 100% coverage of Scotland with deals. We will continue to press the UK Government to work in common purpose by formally committing to 100% coverage and agreeing a timetable to achieve that objective. And finally, we will empower and encourage local and regional partners to continue to grow the emerging network of regional economic partnerships. So, and also, the Scottish Government is committed to driving inclusive growth that will benefit every person, family, village, town and city in our country. The city region deals, other growth deals and the regional partnership they are inspiring will play a crucial part in that mission. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. And I call on Jamie Green to speak to and move the, the amendment 15493.2 in his name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And at the outset, I move the amendment in my name. I also welcome this opportunity to open the debate for the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, and I welcome the opportunity that the Scottish Government has brought to the Chamber to discuss city and regional, regional deals in Scotland. They've resulted in billions of pounds of investment already in recent years and shows really devolution at its very best. The UK and the Scottish governments uh, working together in a collaborative manner for the benefit uh, of all of Scotland. Uh, these benches believe that this is the correct approach and it should be encouraged by all parties in this chamber. To date, we have seen deals signed for the Glasgow and, uh, and Clyde Valley, Edinburgh and South East Scotland, the Tay Cities, Aberdeen, Inverness, Stirling and Clackmannanshire, and the Highlands, at least £2.3 billion of joint investment uh, to date, not an insignificant number. I would like to highlight some of the benefits that this joint investment package has brought already uh, to Scotland. Over £1.3 billion for the uh, Glasgow uh, deal, which is funding uh, key uh, projects. And I would like to touch on the uh, Glasgow Airport Rail Link uh, project, uh, which I think is an important point that Labour make 
uh, today. I will come on to, to your amendment specifically in a moment when I look at our amendment and, and, and the Labour amendment. Uh, but this is just one of a number of key projects that will regenerate uh, the Glasgow region. Uh, amongst others, there are other things in that deal, delivering affordable housing, uh, improving public spaces and building uh, business venues to increase uh, capacity for, for uh, business. Uh, if you look at the £1 billion that's going into the Aberdeenshire uh, deal to support, amongst many other things, the oil and gas sector, to expand the harbour, uh, in which we hope will attract uh, uh, both uh, indigenous and foreign investment, but also diversify the region's economy, something that is much needed. In uh, Inverness, over 300 million to support regional growth, spe uh, specifically targeting tourism and life sciences, which is important to that part of Scotland. Edinburgh in the southeast uh, will see investment to boost uh, Edinburgh's proud academic uh, background, supporting our world leading universities, uh, supporting research and development into cutting edge technologies. And there's the potential in Edinburgh region alone to support up to 21,000 jobs. Uh, some of my colleagues will touch uh, on these specific projects in more detail as we go through this afternoon's debate, and I'm sure we'll hear from right across the chamber specific examples of where city deals uh, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Clack Manager and Sterling, the Tay Cities deals, uh, all creating jobs, all delivering investment right across Scotland. They aren't just visions or proposals. This is a real investment, funding real projects, and having a real impact on our country. Uh, I think uh, to uh, point now to the amendments of today's debate, we are committed to supporting city and regional deals. And we do also want to push to ensure that every bit of Scotland is covered by such a deal of one shape or other. But our amendment today also calls on both governments to continue to work together in signing these new deals. And it also welcomes the significant investment that we have seen to date. We do want to set a clear timetable uh, uh, as was evident in the local government uh, report into city deals, uh, to ensure that every bit of Scotland is covered and we will and are taking seriously the recommendations uh, made in that. And if time permits, I may go through some of those. And I hope that the Scottish Government is approaching today's debate in the constructive manner that the Cabinet Secretary uh, laid out his opening remarks. There's very little, uh, in many cases, to disagree with what he said this afternoon. Uh, the problem that I have with what was said in the chamber versus uh, the motion as it, uh, as it was on paper is that the two narratives didn't quite add up. Nowhere in the government's motion, and it is with regret, I think, does it mention over a billion pounds that has been invested by the UK government in city and regional deals. Whether that is unwelcome investment, I don't think so, uh, given the comments made by the cabinet secretary, or it's simply been omitted from the motion to inform the debate or indeed the narrative of the debate. I don't know, that's up for the government to decide. Um, but also their motion uh, quotes, uh, and I, I quote directly from the motion, and additional investment in city regions. And then goes on to ask the UK government to match fund that investment. The problem with the motion is it doesn't state what that additional investment in the regions is. Uh, and it's entirely still unclear from the opening remarks what this additional investment is, which bit of government is funding which projects and why the UK government should be match funding it. I, I see there is a call for £388 million in here. It's unfortunate that this government debate today does not mention or even welcome, never mind acknowledge, the billion pounds already invested by the UK government. It was said in words, but it's not on paper. And for that reason, for that reason, we're unable to support the motion as it's worded. I'm happy to give way. Jamie Hepburn. If the circumstances were reversed, could Mr Green earnestly and honestly say to this chamber he would not be calling on the Scottish Government to match the UK Government's investment? Surely on the basis of partnership, investment should be equal. Jamie Green. Well, if you, look at, if you actually look at the specific of, of many of the deals, uh, the match funding is, is, is equal uh, uh, on a large majority of them. If you look at the Glasgow City Region deal, it's half a billion pounds each, uh, if you look at uh, the Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City, it was 125 million from each government. There are, there are deals which are specific uh, based on the projects that are contained in those deals, uh, where the UK government uh, has not much funded every penny in those deals because the nature of the projects therein 
uh, for example, include many areas of devolved responsibility. And that's a discussion that the Treasury has been ha having with the Scottish Government throughout this process. And I don't think, you know, if, if, if the premise of this debate is about you haven't put in as much as me, uh, you haven't done what you're supposed to be doing, this whole project, the whole City Deal initiative was a UK government initiative from day one. And we wouldn't even be having this debate if it wasn't for a Conservative government that had agreed to the city region deal. So I think that point is entirely lost on the centre benches today. Can I turn to the uh, Labour's amendment, because I promised I would. Um, I, we, we agree that this uh, Glasgow Airport rail link needs to be progressed as a matter of urgency. There are clear and vital reasons why this project should go ahead. There are major connectivity issues uh, uh, in connecting Glasgow Airport uh, to the West region. The congestion on the M8 is at unbearable levels. And I appreciate there are, there are impasses, and I know the Cabinet Secretary has committed in the past to working with stakeholders to overcome some of these problems. But we think they are not uh, 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 major barriers to progressing this project. I appreciate the premise of city deals is that uh, both governments uh, uh, invest in city regions and it is up to local authorities and local government to decide which projects it progresses with. I think it is unfortunate that the local authorities uh, in the Glasgow deal have not progressed this as we would have liked, but I would like to think that there is goodwill among stakeholders, there's goodwill in the local authorities, uh, at, in the Scottish Government, in the UK Government, in some of the people involved in this discussion around network rail and ScotRail and the delivery and the effect that the rail, rink, the rail link will have on other services. I think if we have the conversation, there is goodwill, it should progress. We will support Labour's amendment to put that renewed focus on that specific project. But it is only one project in one deal as part of a much uh, wider discussion. Uh, starting Ulster City and regional deals are not the only thing that can drive regional economies. Uh, we on these benches believe that devolution is not just a Westminster Holyrood discussion. Uh, we believe in local, real local uh, devolution such as devolving business rates and LBT, LBTT to local government so that they can set rates based on the needs of local economies. And we think this also and additionally can go a long way to drive uh, growth. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned uh, the issue of 100% coverage in future deals. And we agree with them on that. The uh, Scottish Government wants to see all parts of Scotland benefit from some form of deal. So do we. And that's why we today also are pushing for both governments to pursue uh, an open and active dialogue on how and when this could happen. Our own manifesto commits us to the Borderlands deal, uh, which uh, I believe significant progress is being made towards that. The Murray Growth deal, uh, of course, there are also calls for Falkirk, Agal and Butte uh, uh, as well. And we support the premise uh, of these deals. Uh, we too await the formal response from the UK government and will reflect on that response uh, in due course. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's positive commitment to actively working with his counterparts in the UK government on that. Uh, presenting officer, on the Ayrshire Growth Deal, my colleague Brian Whittle is going to go into that in more detail and outline some of the great benefits that that project will deliver and what it will unlock, because I think that is the key to regional deals. They unlock investment opportunity from the private sector, from academia uh, and from other stakeholders. And I think it is vital for areas like Ayrshire to benefit from uh, regional deals. I've been to many meetings on this and I've seen genuine cross-party support. I've sat around the table with uh, Willie Coffey and Kenneth Gibson, uh, with uh, Philippa Whitford, uh, and, and other members of the UK Parliament. And it's that collaborative environment, it's how these deals will work, and it's the only way they are going to succeed. Uh, in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, I want to reiterate our commitment to city region and regional growth deals. They have been a tremendous success. Admittedly, they've not been uh, without their ups and downs. They involve varied political makeups of governments, of local government. They involve often conflict in priorities and agendas and often with governments at loggerheads over many other issues. There's no denying much has happened since these deals were brought into play. Elections, referendum, they all take their toll on progress on this, but there's um, much to be said about this cooperative approach of cross-government. Uh, we should welcome them and not be whining about them. The onus really is on all governments to sit down and get on with it, because that's what business wants, that's what academia wants, and it's what the public wants. We are committed, the UK government is committed, and the Scottish Government is committed, so let's put aside our differences in the interests of all, in, of, all of Scotland.
and deliver on some of these deals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Colin Smith to open and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, President Officer. At a time of relentless centralisation in, in much of government policy, a focus on city and regional growth deals and regional economic partnerships is one that's welcome. Labour believes that if the, the right investment choices are made in growth deals, they can be catalysts for economic growth as part of a wider industrial strategy. But as well as the investment such growth deals can provide, they have the potential to empower communities to develop local solutions for local needs. And the collaboration between neighbour and local authorities gives those local areas a stronger voice, allowing them to advocate for the region on a national level. For the parts of the country whose voices have often been missing from the debate and those where there has been a historic underinvestment, this approach could have a genuinely transformative impact. Last week, the Ayrshire Regional Economic Partnership was announced with the three Ayrshire local authorities bringing their economic development departments closer together ahead of the long overdue signing of the heads of terms for the Ayrshire growth deal. This approach not only establishes a shared framework to support collaborative working, but gives Ayrshire a unified voice on the national stage. But what people in Ayrshire now want to see are the projects in the growth deal actually delivered. The Ayrshire growth deal has been years in development, but so far not a penny of funding has been allocated by either the Scottish or UK government. That needs to change. It's time for both governments to put their money where their mouths are and announce the funding needed to make the Ayrshire growth deal a reality. Likewise, the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal. I had the privilege of being part of the establishment of the Borderlands Initiatives when, when I was a councillor and chaired Dumfries and Galloway Council's Economy Committee. It wasn't an easy process. The Borderlands not only stretches the width of Scotland from the borders to Dumfries and Galloway, but across the border, taking in Cumbria and Northumbria. Five local authorities representing 10% of the UK's landmass and over a million people determined to use our united strength to fight to ensure we are no longer the forgotten regions of the UK. The Borderlands partners were told by the Secretary of State for Scotland that if their proposals for a growth deal were submitted by September last year, it would enable an announcement on funding to be made in the UK government's December budget. The local councils delivered on their side of the bargain, but the UK and Scottish government have not. So far, the only the local councils have invested in the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal with no funding yet from government. There's no mention of either the Ayrshire or Borderlands Growth Deals in the government's motion, but I hope when summing up the Minister will give Parliament an exact timetable when we can expect to see these deals agreed by the Scottish and UK governments and crucially when funding will be announced. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Michael Matheson. In particular on the Ayrshire deal, you'll be aware that the um, Ayrshire partners asked for a signing of the heads of terms uh, on the Ayrshire deal uh, this Friday, uh, on Wednesday, uh, which I agreed to uh, and invited the UK Government to matches on, uh, which they've been unable to do so. From the Scottish Government, there's no lack of trying to make progress in this matter. So we are determined to make progress so we could have signed it this Friday. And on the Borderlands deal, when I met with the partners last week, they accepted they've still got further work they need to do on their individual asks. But one of the big challenges is that getting the timetable set is dependent upon other departments within the UK government that are responsible for the funding elements for those local authorities that are south of the border, which has not been agreed as yet. Colin Smith, I can give you an extra minute, Mr. Thank Smith. you very much, um, President Officer. I, I, I appreciate the intervention from the Cabinet Secretary, but I think he stresses again the frustration there is at local level. We hear earlier that there was close working between the Scottish and UK government, but every single time you ask a UK government minister a question, you get a different answer than you get from a Scottish government question over the timetable and the level of, in that <laughs> and the level of investment by, by both governments. I mean, what the people of the Borderlands, what the people of Ayrshire want is a clear timetable, and they want, most importantly, the funding to be put in place, because at the moment, those are regions that are being left behind the rest of Scotland. I hope the Minister will also tell us, and he can either intervene now or later on if I get more time, uh, wh where discussions are over the future of a Falkirk deal, an Argyll and Butte deal, and also a potential island deal, and what the government view as a, as a realistic timescale to deliver those deals. Those deals, as with the, the city region deals already covering the Glasgow city regions, Aberdeen city regions, Inverness, and Highlands, Stirling and Clack, Manninshire, Edinburgh, and South East Scotland, and the Tay cities have the potential to unlock economic growth. But only by making those deals comprehensive across all of Scotland and focused on the real needs of local communities can that growth be truly inclusive. So we support the government's call for a clear timetable showing when we will get that 100% coverage. As new deals are developed, we need to be clear how growth deals also fit with the wider policy landscape to ensure cohesion and strategy and the clear allocation 
of functions. Last year, the Local Government and Communities Committee report on City Region Deals warned that at present there are too many overlapping and competing initiatives. They also raise concerns over accountability and openness within current deals that do risk undermining the aims and ethos of those deals if they are not properly tackled. Devolving decision making to a regional level is only beneficial if the new process is transparent and genuinely responsive to the communities involved. Put simply, we cannot allow deals to be done in secret behind closed doors. Many of the areas covered by deals include some of our most deprived communities. Those local communities must be involved in the development of growth deals to properly identify their needs and their priorities. The process needs to be more open and democratic so communities have faith in both the process and ultimately the funding choices that are made in those final deals. Crucially, growth deals must be in addition to, not instead of existing funding streams. We cannot simply use deals to distract from declining government investment elsewhere, in particular within local government. They are not there to plug gaps and cannot be a substitute for consistent, strategically allocated national funding. Projects not adopted by growth deals also need to be delivered. Yet just last week, we heard that the £224 million of investment announced by the Scottish Government alongside the Aberdeen City Region deal for rail infrastructure in Aberdeen appears to be being sidelined. Audit Scotland's up-and-coming report on city, region and growth deals will consider a number of these challenges, including clarity around the deals, their governance and accountability processes. I look forward to reading this report when it is published in the autumn of this year, and I hope its recommendations will help guide work to strengthen city, regions and regional growth deals. But, President Officer, the most crucial aspect of any deal is ensuring that the projects agreed are actually delivered. At the heart of Scotland's first city region deal, the Glasgow City Region deal, is the Glasgow Airport project, aimed to link the city by rail to the airport. An airport that serves around 10 million passengers, but to our shame, is the largest airport in the UK that isn't served by rail. A rail link is badly needed. A report for Transport Scotland last year showed that traffic levels on the M8 leading to the airport between Junction 22 and 29 had increased by 22% from 2011 to 2017. Stuart Patrick, the Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, said at the time of the report, the solution can't be the reallocation of road space or more roads. Rail is the most obvious route forward. It's a solution, President Officer, that is long overdue. The first feasibility studies into a rail link were published in the 1990s. In 2000 uh, I certainly will, yes. Richard Lyle. Could the member tell me what happened during the 1999 and 2007 when the uh, Labour uh, Lib executive were on? Why did you not build it? Colin Smith. Previous Labour administration in 2006 developed a clear plan for the Glasgow Rail Link. That plan, that plan, that plan, presiding officer, was cancelled by an SNP government in 2009. Report, since then, report after report have highlighted the benefits to the west of Scotland economy of delivering a, a rail link. A new plan for a £144 million tram train has been developed and agreed. It has overwhelming support. I hear today that it also appears to have overwhelming support from Richard Lyle, who is enthusiastic about a plan. But once again, it's the SNP who are seeking to put barriers in the way to a proposal that everyone supports. The failure to tackle capacity challenges at Central Station does not justify the lack of action, the lack of commitment from the Scottish Government to the Glasgow Airport Rail Link. The Scottish Government Transport Scotland need to work with the Glasgow City Regional. Mr Smith, just closing. The Scottish, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government Transport Scotland need to work with the Glasgow City Region partners to find solutions, not more excuses. President Officer, they need to get on with delivering a rail link that will benefit not just Glasgow, but all of Scotland. I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Andy Whiteman, six minutes, please. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer, and uh, glad to be here to contribute to this debate. Um, as I think Jamie Green pointed out and the Minister, city region deals are agreements that work across the scales of government in the UK, in Scotland and at the local level. And they are political in nature. Ahead of the Scottish independence referendum, in fact, it was the then Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Danny Alexander, who announced in July 2014 that Glasgow would receive £500 million. And within hours, the Scottish Government matched that sum, despite making no formal announcement that there would, in fact, be a programme of city region deals. That was all done in extreme haste and took place in a very politicized environment. And we're now dealing with the aftermath 
uh, of that. A better alternative, in my view, would have been to build on existing capital investment plans by local authorities and to create new partnerships to, to, to focus on regional economies. But we are where we are. We are instinctively as Greens in favour of collaboration between spheres of government, but we do challenge the, heart, the notion at the heart of city region deals, uh, that of sustainable economic uh, growth that is proposed uh, in the debates motion and in the Conservative amendment. As I and my colleagues have said in Parliament before, uh, this very notion is incredibly uh, simplistic. Uh, growth tells us nothing about how wealth is being generated, how it's being distributed, or what the external costs are. And important studies such as that by the Royal Society of Arts, City Growth Commission, and from the University of Strath Clyde's International Public Policy Institute have all recognised that Scotland cannot grow, cannot even have economic growth if we don't tackle inequalities. And that means, in our view, we should be using city deals and regional economic partnerships as an investment for an opportunity for investing in areas where the need is most. And there's no evidence that this is uh, the case within the current uh, deals. Of course, city region deals are delivering some benefits. In Barhead and East Renfrewshire, plans are afoot to build a new train station which would give residents direct access to the rail network. Uh, currently, residents face a, a walk of up to 40 minutes uh, to reach uh, it. But beyond that example, however, transport projects in general are misconceived. In the Highlands, the car is king, 175 million being spent on road improvements, including a link road in Inverness that will take 12 seconds off existing journey times at peak times. And disappointingly, not a penny will be spent on railways in the region. Likewise, in Lothian, 120 million being ploughed into upgrades to the Sheriff Hall roundabout. Meanwhile, just a sixth of that figure will be spent on public transport uh, in the west of Edinburgh. And although, of course, these investments may be celebrated by local politicians, it's a paltry figure that will do very little to, quote, drive inclusive growth, enabling new jobs and wider economic opportunity, as the Cabinet Secretary suggests in his motion. As a member of the Local Government uh, Committee last year, I participated in the committee's inquiry and was particularly interested in the matter of transparency and the fact that in some regions there's been a shift in economic growth or job creation from areas, other areas into the investment areas with no net gains being made. Indeed, Policy Scotland at the University of Glasgow reported in a paper on this issue that there are questions about accountability and transparency and how these issues are dealt with uh, in the deals. And primarily because there is an inconsistency in how deals are negotiated and delivered, there appears to be very different approaches taken to engaging stakeholders and being transparent. One of our witnesses, Leslie Warren, from the Coalition of Racial, uh, Racial Equality and Rights, noted that the local authorities' own public sector duty uh, reports do not show exactly how communities have been involved or the engagement that they've had, and we would expect reports on those things to be part of their current legal duties, never mind uh, the bigger uh, deals. And clear evidence of this uh, is apparent in the City of Edinburgh. The Edinburgh and South East City Region deal, for example, was negotiated behind closed doors with even councillors struggling to find out what projects were on the table ahead of the deal uh, being uh, announced. But that's not always the case. The Taste Cities deal, for example, uh, was a good example uh, of being accountable from the, from the start. Members of the public could view its prospectus and an accompanying website well before plans were agreed in order to understand what, in fact, was being proposed. And this level of transparency is welcome, but not uh, the norm. And nor have other deals taken such a clear, cohesive or thematic approach to their spending plans. As the Cabinet Secretary noted, Audit Scotland has just announced that it will be conducting two performance audits looking at city region deals to provide an independent assessment uh, of how well the Scottish Government, Councils and the UK Government uh, are doing. And in the scoping note they published just uh, a week or so ago, uh, they make the, the, the claim that it is not yet clear what contribution deals will make to Scotland's economy or to the Scottish Government's priority of inclusive economic growth. So we have very, very substantial investment in the billions uh, has been signed off with no clear understanding about the impact it's going to have. And, presiding officer, I believe it's essential in this parliament that we hold the public and private partners of city region deals to account. That's difficult uh, because of the governance structure in order to ensure best value for money. And we'd learn from the recommendations that will in due course be made by uh, Audit Scotland. As an alternative city region deals, Greens would support regional economic development based on transition planning and targeting disadvantage, but that's not what these city region deals are or have turned out uh, to be. 
Uh, in conclusion, Greens will be supporting the Labour amendment. Uh, we're no great fan of airports, but as long as they exist, they should be accessible by public transport. But we will be opposing uh, what the city region deals uh, have turned out to be, uh, and we'll be voting against uh, the Conservative and the Government motions. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd uh, like to rise in support of the Government uh, motion today. We'll also be supporting the Labour Amendment because Glasgow Airport desperately needs better greener public transport connections. And the Scottish Government, it's fair to say, is wobbling on its commitment to this. It has now been 18 months since the Jacobs analysis. And this issue needs to be resolved. People demand better, and it needs to be in the form of a convenient new connection uh, between the city and an international airport. We'll also oppose the Conservative amendment because the UK Government should have continued on the trajectory established by Nick Clegg and Danny Alexander during the coalition uh, with the Glasgow deal, which saw it receive broadly equal levels of funding uh, from the two governments. Um, uh, it's quite early, but I will. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Member, for taking intervention. Does he accept that the genesis of city region deals by Danny Alexander, the Treasury Secretary at the time, was inspired in large part by politics and not by economic development policy? Alex Cole Hamilton. No, I don't accept that. I think this was a recognition that for many years, for decades in fact, the sort of focus of economic investment and infrastructure had been traditionally in the southeast of England and this was about expanding that footprint far beyond and it was a simpler time. I, I think if we look back to Nick Clegg and Danny Alexander making important economic decisions about domestic politics, we'd be rather uh, that politicians in Westminster were making those kind of decisions than having to stockpile medicine in the face of Brexit. Um, but we... We're happy uh, to continue to support the notion of city region deals because they do bring much needed investment, all told uh, £1.3 billion pounds to Edinburgh. And I do accept, I do agree with the Scottish Government on this, that that commitment has ebbed away from the Westminster Parliament, the UK Government, and there is now a gap of £388 million pounds in commitment which needs to be closed. It's an important deal. It's not just for Edinburgh. It's for the regions around Edinburgh, of course. And they all told we represent 24% of the population of Scotland. And that comes broadly into five baskets, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, around research, development and innov innovation with five innovation hubs looking at biotech, data and robotics. It's going to have the first robotarium in the UK. It's a testing space which will see cutting edge science deployed for the very first time. It, it is as Dr. Uh, as Sethu Vijay Kumar, who is uh, director of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, says it will not just drive inward investment through big companies into Scotland. Um, Edinburgh, as the city, it's going to be the uh, base, is the lab for these, will get the first of its benefits. So there is a, a, cycle, a virtuous cycle of investment and development and progress there with it. All told, that's going to represent, uh, they predict, £23 return for every £1 spent. That's not a bad return on government investing. And it complements an expertise in technology and innovation which has graced the streets of our nation's capital since the Enlightenment. We see with it a basket of investment in employability, creating that data-savvy workforce suited to making Edinburgh the data capital of the world. £140 million for transport, and whether that's improved roundabouts or public transport, I agree with absolutely with Andy Whiteman that the investment, the balance there is not quite right, nor will it. It, it is as a drop in the bucket to the investment in West Edinburgh, my constituency, for the proliferation of new housing developments, not least uh, the new town proposed for Winchborough, in the city region deal, which will see uh, traffic siphoning through the places, bottlenecks that already exist, like the Barnton Junction, which are not suitable to capacity, in capacity terms to the demand on their, uh, their capacity right now. Um, and also with it, culture. We can't forget the culture side of this as well. It's an all-rounder, and the concert hall will be most welcome. It is regrettable, however, that the Scottish Government has ruled out using the investment for the tram extension, which its own city-led administration has signalled support for. This, I think, will now have to be met through other means, and, and obviously there will be an opportunity, a cost, to already cash-strapped services. It's a fair and reasonable criticism, I think, also, presiding officer, that uh, the decision-making around priorities for these city-region deals have been largely top-down. And I think we can, again, see that in the paltry amount of um, public transport money for West Edinburgh. If you ask anybody, 
in either Barnton or East Craigs or Guile what they need most out of public transport, they'll tell you it's the return of the number 64 bus service, yet that does not feature in this deal. And the biggest elephant in the room is with it that we have uh, the, the government motion or the government remarks today do not recognise the current threat of a £41 million cut to Edinburgh's budget as a result of this Scottish government um, budget and uh, financial considerations for this year. That is an existential threat to many local services that my constituents enjoy, whether that's the Drylaw Neighbourhood Centre or the Muir House Millennium Centre, which serve some of our nation's capital's most vulnerable residents. Point is, Deputy Presiding Officer, if you look at this in the round, absolutely the city region deal is vital for, um, for improving our economy, for driving progress. But while we turn our eyes to the distant horizons of technology and centres of excellence in our capital, we must not do so at the expense of its most vulnerable citizens. Uh, we're happy to support the government's motion tonight. We'll support the Labour Party amendments. We'll reject the Conservative amendments. I'm grateful for the government in securing time for this debate this afternoon. Thank you. That concludes the opening speeches. And uh, can I take this opportunity to remind all members and the respective groups that those who take part in the debate should be present for the opening speeches. And we now move to the opening open debate. Speeches of six minutes, please. I don't have much time in hand. Shona Robson, followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, I'd like to recognise the efforts of the Scottish Government, the four local council leaders, business and academic chiefs who were involved and have been pivotal in the recent signing of the Tay City Region Deal Heads of Terms Agreement. The city deal comprises Dundee City, Angus, Perth and Kinross and North East uh, Fife. It's home to almost half a million people and over 15,000 businesses and has a strong economic base as a gateway to central Scotland and north to Aberdeen and the Highlands. As part of the deal, both the, the Scottish Government and the UK Government will invest uh, each £150 million over the next 10 to 15 years. With the Scottish Government recently announcing an additional £50 million, we still await the UK Government to match that £50 million, something that they will be constantly reminded of until they do so. It's estimated that those investments have the potential to secure over 6,000 jobs and leave it in over £400 million of investment. The positives for Dundee as part of this partnership are to be welcomed. Dundee has already previously enjoyed Scottish Government investment for new social housing, a revamped railway station and, of course, the, the V&A. Ha Dundee has two world-class universities and an outstanding leading college is one of the leading centres for the computer gaming industry. And last year, the Wall Street Journal ranked Dundee as number five on its worldwide hot destinations list. The deal seeks to support economic and industrial growth across Tayside, support apprenticeships, build new social housing and reduce inequalities, improve transport infrastructure and increase tourism. As Dundee remains the major travel to work area in the region, it could also be the initial starting hub for visitors and businesses to other areas in the region, given the transport links in and out of the city. Therefore, improving transport links and boosting tourism is just one element within the deal. Throughout the region, there are some world-class attractions and Dundee itself offers many locations showcasing the city's heritage, such as the former Jute Mill at Verdant Works, uh, the Discovery, and as I mentioned earlier, the v &E, which of course saw over 100,000 visitors in the first three weeks of opening. And I applaud the Scottish Government's proposed investment of £37 million to support a regional culture and tourism investment programme, which will boost key economic assets in culture and tourism. The Scottish Government's investment also aims to attract longer stays throughout the region and the amount spent per visitor boosting the hospitality and food and drink industry. As I mentioned uh, earlier, Dundee Railway Station has recently been completely modernised thanks to the funding from the Scottish Government and is part of Dundee's waterfront regeneration. However, ensuring visitors have every travel option to come and stay in the city and surrounding areas, the Scottish Government will invest £9.5 million in and around Dundee Airport, looking at securing and marketing new routes, enhancing airport facilities to assist passenger growth and the opportunities arising from the Heathrow expansion. While investing in transport links and tourism will boost the Tayside region economy, it's vital that the area also attracts and retains talented people and creates and sustains new and existing industries. 
The region has a long manufacturing engineering history and I welcome the Scottish Government's £10 million investment in high value manufacturing, for example, the increasing renewable energy sector. Dundee Port has huge potential for capitalising on the renewable energy industry and the Tay Cities deal seeks to maximise the economic and employment benefits of both these industries for the Tay region, not solely for Dundee, but also, of course, in Montrose, in Angus and Methyl in Fife. However, another growing industry for the region is offshore decommissioning. While the oil industry has seen a, a slow improvement with new fields opening or about to start production, rigs in the older fields are becoming redundant and will have to be decommissioned. The industry is worth around £2 billion per annum over the next decade. And Dundee Port and the surrounding brownfield land is ideal for this work. The Scottish Government's Decommissioning Challenge Fund has already demonstrated their support for decommissioning projects. Complementing the investment in manufacturing and encouraging entrepreneurial talent to Dundee, I'm pleased the Scottish Government seeks to invest up to £3 million into Studio Dundee. Based at the city's new waterfront and together with a fully equipped and digitally connected tech lab, the entrepreneurial hub would offer flexible and adaptable co-working space. The deal therefore offers an array of new job opportunities for the people of Dundee, Fife, Perth and Angus. Investing in research and academic posts, new start-up companies, retaining and expanding existing companies and bringing companies to the region. It includes a £20 million investment to deliver fair work through the Tay City Skills and Employability Development Programme, a £25 million Scottish Government investment to grow the Tayside Biomedical Cluster, building on the success of Dundee and surrounding areas, including the University of Dundee as leading centres of excellent locations in the UK and internationally for drug discovery research and minimising invasive surgical techniques and technologies. The investment would also create facilities and a skills development and training programme to support both biotech and medtech through Dundee and Angus College, helping to increase the supply of skilled laboratory staff. With a modern workforce, there needs to be a modern and fast digital connectivity. And this government are investing £2 million in supporting 5G test beds and trials in the Tay region, helping to put it at the forefront of 5G deployment. As we become more and more reliant on the internet and electronic devices, sadly, cybercrime is rising. Strengthening cyber resilience and developing digital forensics is therefore crucial in protecting our identities and personal details. The Albert Tay University has recognised a UK leader for research and teaching in ethical hacking, while Dundee University's Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science are developing leading applications for forensic research. Both universities are helping to grow expertise in cyber security, and the Scottish Government will invest up to £6 million in developing a cyber security centre of excellence or cyber quarter. Uh, Deputy President, I'm cautious please. of time. I hope the projects mentioned are really just a snapshot of what the, is earmarked for the whole Tay City region, something that I very much welcome. I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the chance to speak in this debate also, since the Tay Cities deal will have a large impact on the area I represent, the northeast of Scotland region. On 22 November last year, local council leaders formally signed the 700 million city, Tay Cities deal, with the Scottish and UK governments committing to invest up to 150 million throughout a 10 to 15 year period, with the remainder being levered from private investors. The Tay Cities deal brings together public, private and voluntary organisations in the council areas of Angus, Dundee, Fife and Perth and Kinross to deliver a smarter and fairer region. The initiative aims to fund more than 20 major projects and create an excess of 6,000 jobs across Tayside and Fife. Regional partners have established a strong economic partnership to drive growth. The region has world-class universities and many cutting-edge businesses. Angus, Fife, Dundee City and Perth and Kinross councils are keen to build on the recent momentum after the area was awarded £63 million from the Scottish Government Growth Accelerator model for projects at the Dundee waterfront and the development of the V&A. Under the Tay Cities deal, more than £60 million will go to the James Hutton Institute in Invergowrie, and more than £10 million will go towards a cyber security centre in Dundee. Several million will also be invested in St Andrew University's Eden campus, and £15 million will go towards a Perth bus and rail interchange project. There are five specific investment proposals within Dundee at this stage, totalling up to £65 million. 
These include up to 10 million for investment in and around Dundee Airport and up to 12 million for the development of a cyber security centre of excellence. It also includes up to 15 million to establish the UK's first forensic science research centre and up to 25 million to support the growth of the biomedical cluster. Region-wide investments that will benefit Dundee include £20 million invested in employability and skills. This is particularly important given the Michelin decision in November 2018 that will stop production in Dundee within two years. Now, this is a serious blow to hundreds of employees and their families and will have had and continue to have an effect among thousands of people across Tayside and Fife. It is hoped that the Tay City deals will create an excess of 6,000 jobs for people across the region, including research and academic posts, new startup companies, and migration of companies to the region. This would be especially welcome after recent closures. Now, tourism is a key part of the Tay City's deal. The Scottish Government will invest 37 million subject to approval of a business case to support regional culture and tourism investment program. The aim is to build on current tourism offerings at St Andrews, Glen Eagles and the V&A in Dundee. Dundee was included in the list of top European destinations for 2018 by Lonely Planet. It was named as one of the top holiday destinations for travellers in 2018 by Bloomberg and in 2017 was named as one of the top 10 hot destinations by the Wall Street Journal. It's encouraging to see that Dundee and other areas of Scotland are already recognised as top places to travel to from across the world, and this investment will continue to promote Scotland as a top holiday destination. The Tay Cities deal proposes significant investment across Angus. While Angus is set to benefit from the overall regional investment, three Angus-specific proposals are detailed in the agreement, totaling more than 30 million pounds. 26 and a half million of UK government capital will be invested in projects in Angus to be de developed collaboratively with Angus Council and other local partners. There is also an opportunity to make use of surplus land at the Condor base for new development, of which the UK government will contribute the net value of the land transferred to the deal. Furthermore, £1 million from UK government funds will be invested to improve connectivity in rural Angus. The city deals are intended to be a team effort, with the UK and Scottish governments working together to deliver these investments. However, the SNP have spent more time talking about their disappointment with the deal rather than what they are actually doing. Scottish Conservative MPs worked hard for the deal and their lobbying was vital to providing investments for Angus, which should be a concern for the Angus SNP MSPs. Some SNP politicians bemoan the UK government for not putting in an extra 50 million to the Tay Cities deal, as the SNP have said they will do. However, 40 million of this extra investment will be spent on the Cross Tay Link Road rather than the fallout of the Michelin plant closure, which is where the majority of this extra 50 million had been expected to go. Considering the SNP had already planned this road project regardless of the city deal's money, they cannot claim to be disappointed that the UK government have not given them extra funds, when the SNP themselves should be finding funding to help with the Michelin closure. While I welcome the Tay Cities deal and indeed other such deals across Scotland, it is crucial that the deal is efficiently and effectively managed from now so the benefits can be delivered without delay. Actions, not words, is what is called for. I support Jamie Green's amendment. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to participate in this afternoon's debate, given that city region deals have been an area of focus both in my membership with the Local Government and Communities Committee, which launched an inquiry into these partnerships in March 2017, and also as constituency member for Cunningham North. We know city region deals have the potential to be transformative, with strong evidence to suggest that investment and high quality locally developed projects is key to accelerating economic growth and a way that improves regional prosperity while reducing inequality. Indeed, these are the ambitions set out in Scotland's economic strategy. However, there are also risk factors associated with such a strategy which must be mitigated, such as displacement. In November 2017, Patrick Wiggins, uh, then director of the Ayrshire Growth Deal, told the Local Government Committee, and I quote, the more investment that happens in or close to the centre of Glasgow, the more likely it is to suck up demand in the Scottish economy. That will make it even harder for areas such as Ayrshire to achieve their potential. It is a timing issue, and we do not want Ayrshire to be left behind 
That is why it is imperative that Ayrshire gets mitigation through the right investment as soon as possible to ensure it does meet its full potential. On 28 September 2016, proposals were launched for the Ayrshire Growth Deal seeking £359.8 million of joint funding from the Scottish and UK governments across the three Ayrshire authorities. Nearly two and a half years of procrastination from the UK government followed, during which time I asked nine questions in relation to the deal in this chamber, seeking clarity on when exactly a long-promised deal would become a reality. I was repeatedly reassured that the Scottish Government was ready to move towards signing heads of terms agreement on the Ayrshire Growth Deal as soon as possible, and all three Ayrshire local authorities also expressed support clearly and publicly. Fellow Ayrshire MSPs and MPs have been vocal in their support for this deal and tireless in their pursuit of UK Government action. And I'm pleased that the Scottish Government and Ayrshire Council agreed to sign the Heads of Terms Agreement this Friday, 25th of January, so that Ayrshire may finally benefit from the millions of pounds of long-promised investment. I hope the UK Government will confirm their intent to, intention to sign the deal on Burns Day, which would be apt given the economic contribution the bar that still makes to the Ayrshire economy, even 223 years after his death. Well, the deal falls somewhat short of the funds sought in 2016. The now £324 million joint investment from the Scottish and UK governments is expected to attract £2 billion of private investment and create an estimated 13,000 jobs over the course of its 15-year programme. Inclusive growth is, of course, central to reducing poverty and inequality in each Ayrshire community, whilst the inclusion of more people in the economy will enable stronger and more sustainable growth. This will in turn reduce demand on government spending and public services. Each project included in the Ayrshire Growth Deal has a well-developed business case designed following collaboration between the public and private sectors, local communities and academia. These projects are devised to deliver sustainable long-term growth. This is especially true of the Carbon Energy Circular Economy and Environmental Sustainability Growth Programme, which will include two major projects with investment of around £34 million in Cunningham North. The Plan New International Marine Science and Environmental Centre, ISME, based at Ardrossan, will work to provide solutions to challenges facing the world's seas and society, from climate change to energy and long-term food sustainability. The ISME will bring together leading academics from the University of Glasgow, University of South Clyde, and build on work undertaken by Cumbria's Field Studies Council, the Community of R and Seabed Trust, the Clyde Marine Planning Partnership, and the success of the Lamlash No Take Zone. The proposal also includes developing a West of Scotland Centre for Marine Leisure, which will be a key element in providing a new and bespoke skills qualification for the marine industry. Also included is the proposed Centre for Research into Low Carbon Energy and Circular Economy to be based at Hunterson in my constituency. This will support new technologies, developing skills and training facilities, including parallel research programmes at Strathclyde University and build a leading global centre for advanced technology, smart systems and energy management. Hunterson already has strong private sector investment interests and the capacity to attract international investment to Ayrshire. The collaborative working behind the growth deal also extends to the Regional Economic Partnership, uh, agreed by Ayrshire's local authorities. The partnership will work by uh, Scotland's enterprises and skills agencies, uh, academia, the third and private sectors to ensure necessary resources, workforce and skills are in place to deliver the positive outcomes we all hope to see in Ayrshire. The Ayrshire Growth team, uh, Deal team believe that their proposition is more developed than any other deal at the point of signing heads of terms and is therefore imperative it is signed off as soon as possible, hopefully on Friday, to maintain the confidence of businesses and communities. The case of the UK government dragging its heels over Russia is sadly not unique. The Scottish government has driven such deals forward by investing £1.3 billion into the four city deals in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Inverness, a third more than the UK government. Meanwhile, UK government investment fell short in Aberdeen region by a mammoth £254 million and in the Inverness region deal by £82 million. The Taste City deal also faces delays due to UK government sluggishness. Breaking officer. I am grateful that Scottish Government Ministers and Ayrshire's local authorities are pushing the UK Government to ensure that deals in Scotland are funded 50-50 and that Ayrshire is not left behind. And regarding the Ayrshire, Ayrshire Access Project, I support that, but only if it is not at the expense of rail services to Ayrshire, and that is an issue that still has to be addressed. I sincerely hope that the next time I raise the Ayrshire Growth Deal in this chamber it is in celebration, welcoming the first steps towards delivering the projects with the potential to transform Ayrshire's economy, create new jobs and ultimately drive inclusive growth and prosperity for the people of Ayrshire. Joanne Lamont, followed by Jenny Goldruth. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate 
And I want, in the time I have, to focus on the issue of the Labour Amendment, which says that the Glasgow Airport link must be progressed as a matter of urgency. And I'm certain that MSPs representing Glasgow and the West of Scotland across party will want to support this. I welcome the support that's already been indicated. I'm rather disappointed that the Government Minister spent no time in it in his own opening contribution. But it is essential that Cabinet Secretary understands what is at stake here and confirms his absolute commitment to making this project happen. There is no doubt about the absolutely positive merits of this proposal. The rigour of the business plan is already agreed and the very significant resource of £144 million is in place. The case has already been comprehensively made and it ought not to be necessary for it to be remade and remade and remade again. There is a clear economic case. Very few cities of Glasgow's size and economic significance are without such a link. And there is a clear and present danger of a loss of investment, not just to Glasgow, but to Scotland by prevarication in this project. The airport as a travel hub is important, but it's also a source of important employment. 35,000 jobs in the local economy, many of them high quality skilled jobs. Poor transport links will deter investment. It is already happening. And we'll increasingly see people travelling by car into work rather than by public transport. The congestion is creating a broader challenge across the communities for people getting to work in the city, for example. At peak times, I am advised 90% of buses into Glasgow on the M8 run late. The case for this link is therefore not just an economic one, but an environmental and social one too. So we can, I am sure, agree the theory, but that is not enough. We need to see full progress. Yeah. We need to ask why is there such slow progress? The message I fear, not explicitly articulated, but the impression generally created is that it's all too difficult, too expensive, too complicated. Somewhere in the system, I fear, is the mindset, not how do we make this work, but rather how do we throw in objections, concerns, difficulties to muddy the waters. Not making explicit opposition to the project, but killing it by a multitude of what ifs, perhaps, and maybes. There are serious questions to be asked about the role of Transport Scotland. Yeah. How committed is committed? The Cabinet Secretary must settle this show leadership and ensure that Transport Scotland rises to the occasion. This is public money, which if used to its intended purpose, will have huge and long-standing effect. Instead, what I observe are monies in danger of being frittered away, perhaps in part in funding consultants and analysis to scupper the project, not progress it. And I fear that is the desired conclusion for some. Theoretical support, yes, but in reality, delivering a make, do and mend option that will waste money and not make the transformational change required. And if you're looking for an example of a make, do and mend approach, see Fastlink as a prospect which did not deliver on what it was intended. That will be unacceptable. And in his summary, summing up, I expect the Cabinet Secretary to rule out any approach of a sub-optimal project. And with respect, my, his response of, I am having a meeting about it on Thursday is simply not good enough. This requires leadership from the Scottish Government and we hope in his summing up that we hear a determination from the Cabinet Secretary not to allow this project to run into the sand. The arguments on capacity are a good case in point. For some, they're a useful barrier to the progressing of this project. We should see them simply as basic, practical hurdles to be overcome. The fear of many of my constituents and businesses in Glasgow and beyond is that Transport Scotland in particular has other priorities, which they will not make explicit, but they will ensure are served above this project itself. And what we are seeing, sadly, in my view, it's a form of infrastructure filibustering, a game of delay and deflection in which the clear loser is the economic, community and environmental needs of Glasgow and the West of Scotland. From the Cabinet Secretary today, I seek more 
than just the rhetoric of support. I seek more than his support for this amendment. What I do seek is a commitment to ensure that the apparent dissembling of Transport Scotland is not allowed to continue. Transport Scotland should be actively engaged with other partners and focused on making this project work. The case has been made economically, environmentally and socially. It is unacceptable that there is continued delay when there are so many things about this project are absolutely in place. And I trust that the Cabinet Secretary, on behalf of the Scottish Government, will now show the necessary leadership, not just to go to a meeting, but make sure that this project, which will deliver economically, environmentally and socially for the whole of Scotland, will be delivered on time. Jenny Gilruth, followed by Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In December 2011, the UK Government published its white paper, Unlocking Growth in Cities. Writing in the foreword, then Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, remember him, said the Coalition Government is committed to building a more diverse, even and sustainable economy. Cities will need to show strong leadership and deliver real growth. My message to them is to seize this opportunity to work with us to break open our politics and lay the foundations for lasting growth. From David Cameron's big society to the EU referendum, Mr Clegg was certainly right about one thing. Our politics have well and truly broken open since the winter of 2011. Unfortunately for Scotland, the opportunities afforded by the city deals did not materialise until the summer of 2014. And I would certainly invite opposition members to ponder as to why that may have been, as Andy Whiteman has already alluded to. As previously mentioned today, almost exactly a year ago, the Scottish Parliament's Local Government and Communities Committee, of which I'm a former member, published a report entitled Deal or No Deal. The report was not a mystic Meg premonition of the Prime Minister's handling of Brexit, rather it was a concise cross-party look at how the city-region deals have operated. The focus for the UK Government, as was clear in the 2011 White Paper, was that of growth. Indeed, cities are described as engines of growth. Today's motion outlines the Scottish Government's focus on inclusive growth, which highlights the inherent ideological tension between the two administrations. As the Joseph Rowntree Foundation noted in evidence to the Local Government Committee, inclusive growth has the potential to gain support across the political spectrum. A more inclusive economy will reduce poverty and inequality. Growth for the sake of it, therefore, is not enough. It has to be about tackling inequality and levelling the playing field. For my constituency, that's a fundamental. Leavenmouth is the largest urban area in the country without, with a population of over 37,000 people without direct access to rail. One in three children live in poverty. Leavenmouth Academy is the second highest recipient of Scottish Government pupil equity funding in the country, funded, uh, a funding which is benchmarked against free school meal entitlement. The need for inclusive growth to tackle generational inequality and poverty has never been more present. The Edinburgh City Region Deal, which covers Fife, will see investment of over a billion pounds across the six local authority areas involved. However, presiding officer, I, I do remain concerned at the lack of detail over what this will mean for my constituency. And my concern has always been about the transparency or lack thereof at a local authority level when prioritising the funding of projects. And indeed, as campaign group Transform Scotland commented in evidence to the local government committee, the selection process was shrouded in a degree of secrecy on the basis of being sensitive or confidential, at least until they are agreed. The Federation of Small Businesses told us there are big concerns about the lack of transparency at the development and implementation stages and the lack of more inclusive and discursive engagement with the private sector. Now, part of that transparency relates directly to funding. And as the co-leader of Edinburgh City Council, Council Ad Councillor Adam McVeigh told the committee, at the start of the process, both governments have an idea of how much they're able to put in. It would have been really helpful to have had that information and analysis as early as possible. In our case in Edinburgh, we had the UK government scrambling around trying to find money to match what the Scottish government was willing to put in. That was an unhelpful tail end to the process. It did not give us an opportunity to look at the overall envelope and apply the level of scrutiny to the detail that we wanted. And therein lies the rub. I note the Conservative amendment today and the assertion of collaboration between the two governments. But let's get real for a moment. The city deal funding for Glasgow from the UK government was merely a sweetener during the independence referendum because at no point since this time has the UK government stumped up the cash without serious political pressure from the Scottish government in Edinburgh. They have had to be chased to match the Scottish government funding for the Edinburgh deal in the summer of 2017. They fell short of their contribution to the Aberdeen region deal by 250 million, in Inverness by 82 million pounds and across the water in Dundee by 50 million pounds. A partnership of equals, more like a parcel of rogues. 
And on the subject of sweeteners before the 2014 referendum, page 12 of the UK Government's 2011 white paper makes explicit mention of the greater freedoms to invest in growth, stating from 2014 a new round of structural fund programmes, aka the European Regional Development Fund and the European Social Fund, will allow member states to adopt a special focus on cities. Presiding officer, 2014 provided Scotland with lots of promises. European Union membership was one of the most prized. And now, as that broken promise withers in the vine, we are invited to believe in today's Conservative amendment, which reaffirms that the people of Scotland are best served when its two governments engage in a collaborative and cooperative manner. Collaboration, cooperation, the dream team, seriously. Presiding officer, to be effective, our city region deal should have asked our constituents what they wanted. Unfortunately, the previous Labour-led administration on Fife Council chose not to effectively engage the public in this process. It chose not to ask for the Leaving Mouth Rail Link, supposedly the authority's number one transport priority. That transport priority could have made a transformative change in my constituency and beyond. Joining up jobs in Edinburgh, for example, with a part of the country which has the lowest car ownership in uh, Scotland. So, from the Tories today, grand words about collaboration, but in reality, the city deals in Scotland were only ever a political stunt for the Conservatives. Yeah. Useful in 2014, but disposable five years on. And for Labour, well, as we know, their amendment today is entirely focused on the Glasgow Airport link, supported by the same member who will tomorrow raise the Leaving Mouth Rail link in a question to the Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Isn't it a pity that Labour consistently seem to forget about their priorities for Fife? Or perhaps, presiding officer, it is simply a convenient excuse. The members in our last Thank minute. You. Finlay Carson, followed by Maureen Mote. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Borderlands growth deal is supported by the Chancellor following a pledge in the 2017 Conservative Election Manifesto and a commitment reiterated in his October budget. Last year saw the proposals for the Borderlands growth deal submitted. And five councils from both sides of the Scotland-England border are tasked in bringing this growth deal into reality. Today, I welcome the message from the Secretary of State for Scotland that he aims to be in a position to announce the quantum for the deal ahead of the English partners uh, PURDA, which should hopefully allow heads of terms to be signed shortly after the end of their PURDA period towards the end of May. With Scottish and English authorities involved, the Borderlands growth deal is unique. However, I do not believe it's been particularly satisfactorily, uh, a particularly satisfactory process, particularly with regards to uh, local authorities' transparency. Granted, with its cross-border nature, it was never going to be an easy process. The Scottish Affair Committee at Westminster produced a report almost four years ago entitled Our Borderlands, Our Future. Conclusions in the report included references to the lack of infrastructure and the movement of young people away from the area. These issues continue to damage the local economy. So we cannot allow this opportunity to pass us by. We must ensure that Borderlands will deliver the opportunities that will attract our young, youngsters to live, work and bring up their families in the Dumfries and Galloway region. In terms of this deal, let me put into perspective, this growth deal has to bring together a geographical area that is larger than Wales, with a population of just under 1.1 million. And if you put the Borderlands area into the south of England, it would stretch towards and into France. This deal is unlike any other city growth deal. We don't have the ability to recoup rates on major building projects or invest in large manufacturers. This deal must be and is different and it must deliver positive Im economic impacts right across its huge geographical area, addressing the growth constraints of working age population, limited employment opportunities, poor digital and transport infrastructure, the lack of high quality sites and facilities and lower skills levels. Economically, the need for the Borderlands growth deal has never been greater. The facts are stark, and it's worth laying them down again in the chamber, as they were last week in the Labour Party's business. Uh, sorry, I don't have time. The gross value added in Dumfries and Galloway is only 80% of the Scottish national average. Dumfries and Galloway is the lowest paid region in Scotland, with wages 15% below the national average. With an aim of delivering identified projects right across the region, the growth deal could support the delivery of an additional 1.3 billion in gross value directly benefiting 1.1 million residents and generating over 6,500 jobs over the 10-year deal. The deal focuses on five strategic drivers under the headers of digital, energy investment company, quality of place, destination borderlands, knowledge exchange network, and business infrastructure program. 
Now, I've often highlighted the lack of investments in a transport infrastructure in the southwest. A transport infrastructure is simply not fit for purpose. I also welcome within the Borderlands proposal a section highlighted as digital borderlands with an ambition to ensure a package of investments to tackle market failures by rolling out full fibre connectivity complemented with 4G and 5G mobile connectivity. As I mentioned earlier, the Borders Growth Deal is unique in my eyes and one of the challenges of this deal will be to ensure that the whole Borderlands area benefits and no areas are left behind as we forge our cross-border links. In terms of my own constituency, I believe this deal can help deliver on the vision laid out in a recent report for Strat for Stranraer to be the capital of the West, aiming to build on the town being a gateway to Europe, Ireland and the rest of Scotland. I have raised many times the need to re regenerate Stranraer as a priority, a town which has the SNP have promised so much to it since the ferry service departed, but have failed to deliver. There is massive untapped potential in the town, with already identified innovative possibilities and massive tourism potential. The East Pier and the waterfront must not be overlooked. I do welcome the south of Scotland gaining more focus as an economically disadvantaged region from those in authority. Indeed, last week I was in attendance with the bill evidence for the proposed South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. Businesses and our rural communities deserve a boost. It has been a long time coming, but I remain positive about how the Borderlands deal, if implemented correctly, can fulfil the needs of our businesses and communities in practice. We are in the final stages of the Borderland growth deal now. 2019 can be the year when the communities and businesses I represent receive a much needed economic shot in the arm from the Borderlands growth deal, a deal which can tap into a region's potential which has bubbled on the surface for far too long. Thank you. I call Maureen Watt to be followed by Neil Bibby. Ms. Watt, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I too am pleased to be taking part in this debate. It takes place in the context of a clear Scottish Government economic strategy, believing that our economy needs inclusive economic growth in all of Scotland for our country and its people to flourish. The city-region deals are designed to act as enablers for local organisations to drive uh, inclusive economic growth where investment in high-quality, locally devised and developed projects will improve regional prosperity while reducing inequality. Now, um, the Aberdeen city-region deal was one of the ones first off the block. I think there was more impetus in the northeast due to the downturn in oil and gas. And the, was one of the first of the, of the city deals to be agreed uh, with the heads of terms agreement being signed in January 2016. The deal uh, was, uh, as I say, signed in 2016, a 10-year programme of investment worth in excess of 800 million. The main partners being Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, the Scottish Government, the UK Government, and uh, Opportunity North East, Robert Gordon University, and the University of Aberdeen. At that time, 125 million was pledged both from the Scottish Government and the UK Government with the potential to unlock over 500 million from private sector investment. Subsequently, the Scottish Government added another 100, uh, 254 million, which the UK Government has yet to match. The Scottish, um, the focus of the Aberdeen City Region deal is a focus on innovation, internationalization and infrastructure. And 11 projects have been identified with the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, the first investment already open uh, in February 2017. The um, financial projections, I know Andy Whiteman isn't here, he's, he said there has been no financial projections, the projections of the financial incomes, outcomes of the Aberdeen City Region deal uh, have been made and it is estimated that there will be an annual increase in GVA of 260 million across Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeen Shire Council areas, 220 million uh, at, through the rest of, of Scotland and 190 million uh, into the UK in general. The average of 330 new jobs per year will be created 
aggregating to some 3,300 new net jobs over the 10-year lifetime of the, the deal. It also estimates there are annual, additional annual tax revenues to the UK and Scottish Government of 113 million from income tax, national insurance, VAT and oil tax revenues. It is based on inclusive economic growth, sustainability and retention of people locally. So I'd like to mention some of the key projects. I've already mentioned the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, which is up and running. Um, it's based in the centre of Aberdeen, but with a global reach for solving offshore mature basin subsea, uh, subsea and decommissioning technology challenges. The innovations are in five key areas of well construction, small pools, asset integrity, decommissioning and digital transformation. This is working in partnership with industry, academia, the supply chain and supported by the regulator and both governments. It has already fostered 80 ongoing projects, 400 technologies have been screened by the OGTC Solutions Centre. It has secured 22 million of industry investment when the original expectation was just 8.5 million and it secured an additional 1.9 million in funding from the Scottish Government Decommissioning Challenge Fund. And this all led to the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the OGTC, Robert Gordon University and the University of Aberdeen for a multi-million pound joint venture to develop a centre for excellence for field life extension and decommissioning. I'm sure everyone will agree that this is indeed a great deal of progress in a short time. The next one I'd like to mention is the Biotherapeutics Biothera Innovation Hub, which sees an investment of four, uh, 40 million over 10 years. Um, I already spoke about this project in a debate on life sciences we had uh, recently in this uh, chamber. It is designed to accelerate growth and build on the strength of the life sciences in the Northeast region. The project is led by one and developed in partnership with the two universities and Scottish Enterprise. And the hub will provide a focal point and space for the industry to collaborate and innovate on products and therapies for biotherapeutics, modern uh, epidemics, medtech diagnostics, and nutrition. To date, we have seen the business case approved by the Scottish Government and the UK Government in September 2017, and a new company, Bio Aberdeen Limit Limited, set up to manage and develop the hub. And construction is expected to commence this year with the hub opening in winter 2020. Jamie Green mentioned the harbour development as if this was part of this city deal. It is not. The harbour at the Bay of Nig is being constructed entirely by the Port Authority uh, Aberdeen Harbour, uh, which is due for completion in 2020. It's an entirely uh, investment by the harbour. However, the infrastructure no, you must wind up, Ms. Around, around the harbour is really important, and it's important that that is developed at a really uh, quick pace. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Answer. I did wave my pen. I was trying not to interrupt. I call Neil Bibby to call, followed by Alistair Allen, please, Mr. Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, like Joanne Lamont, I welcome this debate and the opportunity to speak in favour of Labour's amendment, which calls for the Glasgow Airport Access Project to be regressed as a matter of urgency. The Glasgow Airport Access Project is our best hope for a direct rail link between Glasgow Airport and the city centre via Paisley. Yep. There is a 471-page business case. Yep. There is widespread support from the business community. There's £144 million of funding in place right now, ready to go. What Colin Smith's amendment tests today is the level of political support for the project in the Scottish Parliament and from the Scottish Government. President officer, there is overwhelming independent support for an airport rail link from Renfrewshire Chamber of Commerce and the wider business community in Renfrewshire. And there has been many, there has been for many years. It's been mentioned that businesses are key partners. Businesses I speak to are warning us that failure to invest in surface access is putting Glasgow Airport and the local economy at a disadvantage. While passenger numbers are rising, 
Numbers at Edinburgh Airport, which benefits from a direct tram service, are rising faster. Yeah. There is real concern that continued uncertainty will deter private investment in the area. There is even concern that it has done so already. With growing congestion on the M8, surface access to the airport is becoming more and more challenging. The section of the motorway with the biggest increase in congestion is the stretch between the airport and the west of the city. As has been mentioned, according to a Transport Scotland report, from 2008 to 2017, there has been a 22% increase in traffic levels between junctions 22 and 29. That's from St James's Interchange to the city centre. There are already an estimated 30,000 people working within a three to four mile radius of Glasgow Airport. With national innovation centres coming to Renfrewshire and with the city deal authorities also promoting industrial sites at Glasgow Airport as an investment area, there will be a further increase in the numbers commuting into Renfrewshire. Standing still is simply not an option. As Joanne Lamont has said, Transport Scotland have to get on with the job of making this happen. They have to work with local authorities and deliver the rail link Renfrewshire has already waited on far too long. You can board a train at Glasgow Central and take a direct route to Manchester Airport, but not to Glasgow Airport. That is a ludicrous situation and has to change. Under this proposal, a tram train linked to Glasgow Airport would just take 16 and a half minutes. It has been selected as the best successor to Garrow on the basis that it offers value for money, short journey times and the greatest attraction to users. There can be no doubt that enhancing airport connectivity enhances Scotland's position as an international destination. It is, after all, estimated that 75% of tourists visiting Scotland arrive by air. But the economic impact of the rail link is not simply a matter of making travel easier for air passengers. It's about shovels in the ground. It's about local jobs in Renfrewshire. It's about supporting other city deal initiatives like the airport investment area. It's about modal shift, getting people who commute in and out of Renfrewshire onto public transport. It's about taking the strain off of one of the most congested stretches of motorway in the whole country. Glasgow Airport is the single biggest private sector employer in, in the Renfrewshire area. The number of jobs supported by the airport in Renfrewshire area could rise from 4,500 to 7,200 by 2040. Failure to tackle congestion and deliver a direct rail link, however, would undeniably stifle growth and jobs at the airport and in the surrounding area. The Scottish Government made that mistake before in 2009, and we cannot afford for that mistake to be made again. Would you? Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the member for giving me. I've got a huge amount of sympathy for the, the words he's saying in his speech. However, there is a genuine issue around the current proposal that may mean there is a knock-on effect to train services in the west of Scotland, including Inverclyde and Ayrshire, the area we both represent. Has the member given any thought around how we could overcome some of these issues and make some progress? Neil Bibby. I think those issues are easily overcome, and I'll, and I'll address that shortly. The last time a proposal for a transformative Glasgow Airport rail link was in front of the SNP government, they scrapped it. And in a debate in this parliament in 2013, they, vote, they voted for a motion which branded the rail link ill-conceived. Last week in this chamber, the Cabinet Secretary could only bring himself to mention the possibility of the rail option. I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, there is nothing optional about this project. It is an economic necessity. The 10-year challenge is popular on social media right now. Snapshots into people's lives a decade apart to see how much things have changed. In 2009, the Scottish Government scrapped the Glasgow Airport rail link in a disgraceful act of economic vandalism. It's now 2019 and we need to see urgent progress on the airport access project. Unfortunately, in the past 10 years, the only train on the back of the Garrow debate has been the gravy train for government consultants. Mm -hmm. Delay after delay, excuse after excuse. This government's failure to manage rail capacity at Glasgow Central used as a justification for the failure to get on with a surface rail link. The lack of vision when it comes to Glasgow Crossrail, mirroring the, their lack of foresight when they scrapped the rail link in the first place. A rail link to Glasgow Airport is only back on the political agenda now because in 2014 Labour councils put it there, just like we championed Garrow. And as Joanne Lamont said, understandably there is concern about the SNP's real commitment to this project given their past behaviour. When they've not been ambivalent about it, they've been opposed to it outright. But now is the time to get on with it. 
There is no reason why the airport access project cannot be taken forward in the new control period. There is no reason why the Transport Scotland cannot work with the city deal authorities to make this project happen. Instead of creating problems, Transport Scotland should be finding the solutions needed. There is a business case, there is funding, and there is support from the public and stakeholders. It is time for the SNP, locally and nationally, to learn from their mistakes and finally get on with the Glasgow Airport Rail Link that the local economy and Scotland needs. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Allen, please. Presiding officer, um, we've been talking about city deals, but representing an island constituency, I will spend much of what I have to say focusing on the related issue uh, of the island deals and uh, the potential that that would have uh, for the three island councils in Scotland, Corland and Yenon Shear, Orkney and Shetland, who've been working hard over the last few years to put forward ambitious plans. Although uh, it is worth saying at this stage that these are plans for which as yet uh, the UK government has given no commitments. The Islands Deal will seek to build on the Our Islands Our Future campaign launched by the three island councils in 2013. Uh, Liam MacArthur, Tavish Scott and myself will be co-hosting a reception later this month in Parliament to give MSPs the opportunity to learn more about these proposals. Now, although you would expect me to say this, it is true, the Western Isles are a truly wonderful place to live. We boast some of Scotland's most spectacular scenery as well as one of its most vibrant traditional cultures. We have one of the lowest crime rates in Scotland, one of the highest rates of happiness and fulfilment, although uh, they're not in the chamber, but I should uh, admit that we regularly uh, share those distinctions with Orkney and Shetland. We shouldn't be shy about promoting uh, these facts relentlessly given the number of job vacancies which the islands will have to try to fill over the next few years. However, and it's related to that, we do face some challenges, the starkest of which in the case of my own constituency is depopulation. National records uh, population projections uh, showed a projected decrease of 4.8% for the Western Isles by 2026. And there are no easy fixes to tackling depopulation on that scale and its underlying causes. However, more than anything else, these figures highlight the need for bringing more jobs to the islands and attracting more people uh, to live here. And that's why I'm pleased uh, to see the kinds of projects being put forward in the uh, potential islands deal, uh, which are truly transformative, uh, if transformational uh, in nature. For example, the proposals, the efforts to establish the UK's first commercial spaceport in North Uist. This is a great example of turning relative uh, geographical remoteness into an advantage. And when you consider the existing assets and infrastructure in place due to uh, the Hebrides MOD missile test range, um, then North Uist is ideally placed to capitalise uh, on uh, these proposals. Something else that has also captured the public imagination has been the mooting of fixed link crossings, for example, across the Sound of Harris. Uh, and this would, uh, if it came to pass, radically improve the transport connectivity between the islands that I represent. And while it might sound fanciful to some, it uh, does make sense uh, if, to paraphrase Roosevelt, we look to Norway, or indeed if we look to the Faroe Islands. In both countries, we see networks of such tunnels under a sustained building program, uh, and there is also a practical need for it, given both the immense pressure on the Sound of Harris during the summer and the MCA's recategorisation of the vessels required for it. While not as eye-catching as underwater tunnels or spaceports, proposals to upgrade and complete the Western Isles spinal route, our main road, uh, would have no less a transformational effect. The Western Isles main road runs from Ness via two ferries and several causeways to the Isle of Vathersey in the south. Much of this main road is single track, by which uh, I mean you have to stop to let other cars pass. And there remains a great deal of main road still to be upgraded, and it would take significant capital, it must be said, so to do. And while I hear what Andy Whiteman said about uh, investing in rail, uh, it is probably, I would concede, not yet a realistic proposal to bring rail to my constituency. Other projects in housing, digital and mobile connectivity, housing, tourism and port development are also being pursued. City uh, region deals such as what is being put forward for the islands are enablers to drive inclusive economic growth and the Scottish Government has been driving much of this work forward nationally. 
As other members have noted, the UK government has fallen short and failed to match the Scottish government's contribution in several city region deals, and as I say, in the case of the islands deal, has yet not made commitments. Only a few months ago, the islands minister, Paul Wheelhouse, confirmed the commitment of the Scottish government, however, to assisting the three island councils in working towards a deal for the islands. We now need a formal commitment on that from the UK government. Now, I have to say that while we have been looking for consensus today, uh, the dismissive tone adopted by one or two of the Conservative speakers today uh, was ill-judged, but um, uh, there you have it, and that's what we have on the record. But what I can say is that ministers from both governments have made it very clear to, um, to everyone who will hear that despite these deals being joint uh, initiatives, uh, the funding for projects is still highly delineated on either reserved policy objectives or devolved policy objectives. According to Lord Duncan, the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Scotland office, this is partly at the insistence of HM Treasury, which takes the view that its expenditure must be in the reserved space as spending on any other objective risks double spending. The insistence of the UK government that they must rule out such double spending uh, at the same time as they are providing £1.5 billion to constituencies of certain MPs in Northern Ireland, or while the Scottish Government finds itself spending on reserved areas like social security and broadband to make up for the UK's shortcomings, makes these arguments from the UK all the harder to understand. In any case, while it may come to pass that not all of these projects can be included in an island's deal, they each have the capacity to unlock substantial investment, creating jobs and opportunities, and giving more people a reason to live in that part of Scotland. Thank you very much. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate and will once again use my time to extol the virtues of Ayrshire and the importance of the Ayrshire growth deal to the development of the local economy and the economy of Scotland as a whole. And in highlighting the many attributes of God's own country that is Ayrshire, it would be remiss not to mention at this time of year that our wee corner of the world becomes the centrepiece for so many dinners around the globe as the world celebrates, celebrates the work of Burns. Ayrshire is indeed a wondrous destination with such beautiful coastline and countryside, some of the best golf courses in the world, historic buildings and estates such as Dumfries House and Colleen Country, uh, country Park. It's a fantastic place to work, live, and bring up a family. However, Ayrshire has experienced low levels of economic growth, diverging significantly over the years from both Scotland and the UK. As a result, Ayrshire currently represents a declining share of Scottish GVA. It also lags behind GVA per capita in Scotland and in the UK as a whole. Without intervention, Ayrshire's GVA is forecast to grow at a slower rate than Scotland and the UK. With the current underperformance of the Ayrshire economy, we experience persistently low levels of ec economic participation, high levels of deprivation, and the consequential impact on levels of educational attainment, poor levels of health, and high levels of demand for public services and welfare support, as well as being, uh, having a 7% unemployment rate, which is well above the rate in Scotland. That is why the Ayrshire growth deal is crucial to the long-term economy of Ayrshire and the Scottish economy uh, as a whole. However, Deputy Presiding Officer, I met with the Scottish Secretary David Mendel and local MP Bill Grant last Friday following their meeting in Westminster with the Ayrshire Growth Deal team. And the great news from that meeting is that the signing of the Heads of Terms uh, of Agreement with the Scottish Government will go ahead and is imminent. So many congratulations to the Ayrshire Growth Deal team and the three councils for their persistence and hard work in getting this over the line. And I think also in the spirit of collaboration, I think we should note that, that uh, MSPs and MP, MS, MSPs from across the chamber and MPs from many political parties uh, have been party to, to putting that pressure on both governments. And what I want to do, Deputy Presiding Officer, in terms of a topic I have highlighted many times in this place, which is the, the transport infrastructure and the importance of that in integrated strategy sitting alongside an Ayrshire growth deal cannot be underestimated. This chamber has heard on numerous occasions the well-rehearsed issue of the long neglected investment in the transport infrastructure in the South West. One of the elements that I don't feel has been emphasized enough in relation to the success of an Ayrshire growth deal investment is the need for a transport infrastructure that is fit for purpose. To leverage the maximum benefit that the Ayrshire growth deal can deliver, there is a pressing need to look not just at the much discussed A77 and rail links south of air as well as the 75 and 76, 
consideration must be given to the state of the A77 connection to the M74. And the Belfield interchange has long been a barrier to development in Kilmarnock. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the length of traffic jams that snake all the way down the on and off ramps and onto the main A77 trunk road can only leave you with the conclusion that uh, an, uh, it's long overdue an upgrade. I'd also mention the potential to open up Cumnock Rail Station with such a main project highlighted within the growth deal. Cumnock may be able to disconnect from the main grid and become energy self-sufficient, which I think uh, is, is the first town in Britain to do so and surely merits further investment in its rail station. Deputy Presiding Officer, despite its current challenges, uh, Ayrshire has so much to offer. It already has significant footholds in key industries. I went on an engineering technology tour of Ayrshire during the summer, and there are so many great companies doing innovative and exciting projects. Companies such as Magnox and EDF and UPM, GSK, DSM, Merck, BAE Systems, Spirit, GE Aviation, Wabtec, Highspec, and PRA, to name some. How many of us knew that nearly every fire engine and associated appliance in the UK was built in Cumnock? Um, and uh, uh, Emergency One employ around 125 people and are a vital uh, component to the local and Scottish economy. And that is alongside the many innovative and emerging uh, high-tech companies like Utopia Computers in Kilmarnock who build custom PCs for graphics, gaming and virtual reality for clients across the world. We have excellent local education at Ayrshire College and the University of West of Scotland and can enable local people to develop the skills they need to contribute to a growing Ayrshire economy. There is an increasing focus on STEM skills in schools, preparing young people for career opportunities in science, technology, manufacturing and digital. Ayrshire College is increasingly focuses on STEM skills with a third of its provision in this area. Local tech and engineering companies are working with colleges to develop courses specific for the needs of the local economy. We have the opportunity to combine that academic and industrial expertise in the UK and Scotland with the aerospace engineering expertise at Presswick to capture a significant share of the emerging space industry. Securing the UK's first space, spaceport here extends the potential still further. The case for driving economic growth in aerospace and space and life sciences and industrial biotechnology sectors is compelling at a national level. And what is absolutely crucial is that in Ayrshire, we have the space to do it. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, when it comes to the potential in Ayrshire, the sky is not the limit, literally. Ayrshire has been forgotten and ignored for too long, and I ask both the Scottish Government and the UK Government to continue their drive towards an Ayrshire growth deal and reward the huge efforts made by the growth deal team and from the three councils. There are potentially some exciting times for Ayrshire coming down the track, and I look forward to seeing the much-needed investment through, move from the planning stage and into full implementation. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Willie Coffey. Mr Kidd is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Mr Kidd, please. Well, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, the Glasgow City Region deal is a good deal for our constituents as it introduces significant infrastructure and community-focused projects that will directly improve the quality of life uh, of our people by boosting local economies and improving day-to-day -day living. The Clyde Waterfront and Renfrew Riverside development project, which includes a bridge between Yoker, part of my Glasgow Anisland constituency, and Renfrew, will bring in excellent job opportunities. It's anticipated that this bridge project will create a whopping 2,300 jobs and inject £867 million into the regional economy. This bridge ranks as one of the top performing economic growth projects in the Glasgow City Region deal. And the SNP government is demonstrably committed to driving economic growth, encouraging innovation in our cities and regions, and laying essential foundations for jobs and prosperity. I do have to say, however, that the UK government's significant lack of match investment is deeply disappointing. That Conservatives have consistently over-promised and under-delivered in Scotland, and it seems odd that they could afford a billion pound payoff for the DUP, but refused to find the funds to match the Scottish Government's yep. contribution yep. to our Absolutely. regional economies. And it's essential that the Westminster Government now answer for the missing £388 million overall and stop shortchanging the people of Scotland. However, back to cheerier things, and the <laughs> SNP's commitment to the city-region deals 
shown by our injection of one and a half billion pounds into these and half a million pounds in particular into half a billion pounds in particular into Glasgow is going to have a significant impact in our local economies. The level of jobs anticipated in the Clyde waterfront and Renfrew Riverside area evidences this. The impact of the deal in improving quality of life for our constituents must also be acknowledged. Day-to-day -day activities and experiences have a significant impact of, on our well-being and state of mental health. These are things like clean and healthy transport to and from your place of work rather than being in congested streets with bad air pollution, good eco-friendly and speedy transport that gets you where you need to go can vastly improve the start of your day and the rest of it following on. Community and enjoyable things to do in our free time, light walks in green spaces cannot be underestimated. These components of life are all deeply personal. Nevertheless, here in Parliament, we have the opportunity to bring about or advocate for changes that promote this stability, well-being and sense of community throughout Scotland through these deals. The City Regional Deal provides opportunity to put projects in place that we know will stimulate local economies, create an environment for communities to flourish and put in place an infrastructure that reduces congestion and the building of new bridges and to connect communities across the Clyde, for example. All of this facilities, facilitates making Glasgow and the surrounding areas the best that they can possibly be for all our constituents. City region deals are about our collective vision for an area that we love and want to see prosper into the future. When at the drawing boards, those leading the deal appreciated the importance of sharing in a collective vision. Because of this, consultations have taken place, allowing all Glaswegians to input into this vision for what we want our city streets to look like. Investment into infrastructure in Glasgow will bring modern offices, cycle paths, and bridges that look sleek and modern whilst promoting well-being through the green spaces and walkways woven throughout. Whilst this is exciting, this type of investment into our surroundings, when coupled with other targeted policies, has a transformative impact on general mental health. The World Health Organization published research that looked at the impact of our environmental surroundings on mental health. The findings highlighted two key messages. The first was that socioeconomic factors and physical environments in which people live shape their mental health. The second advised policymakers that taking action to improve the conditions of daily life provides opportunity to improve a population's mental health. We can conclude from this that investment into our general environment in a way that makes public spaces enjoyable is actually very important. The Clyde Waterfront and Renfrew Riverside project is something that I know my constituents will be particularly pleased about. In recent years, they have approached me about improving connections between Yoker and Renfrew, and this frankly new, stunning piece of engineering designed by Sweco and the award-winning designers of the Falkirk Wheel, the Kettle Collective, will bring Yoker and Renfrew uh, together. The bridge will not only bring increased footfall to local Yoker businesses, but this new throughway across the city will give local residents easy access for health and shopping. There are many reasons why this is a good deal for my Annie's Land constituency, which Yoker is part of, and the city as a whole. The £1.13 billion investment through the Glasgow City Region deal will, I believe, go far in driving innovation and growth whilst ensuring that Glasgow grows as a place that people love to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Kidd. I call Willie Coffey, then we move to closing speeches. Mr Coffey, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. It's been good to hear all the different priorities for our communities from colleagues right across Scotland during the debate. And it shows the diverse range of issues, problems and expectations that the growth deals will hopefully deliver in the coming years. Uh, this government strategy to cover the whole of Scotland with investment and assistance packages is, is the right one. And it means that there is something for every, every community to look forward to. The biggest, of course, is the Glasgow City Region deal highlighted by Bill Kidd just there. Uh, with over a billion pounds going in to improve transport infrastructure, to grow the life sciences sector, support new business innovation, and to tackle unemployment, particularly in the 16 to 24 age group, and to boost opportunities for those in low wages and the more vulnerable 
in our communities. I mentioned the Glasgow deal firstly to make a simple point that the spin-off benefit of this investment, if successful, goes beyond the boundaries of Glasgow and its immediate partner authorities. Ayrshire and Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley will also benefit from this, especially the business park project that I think is in the scheme proposals uh, adjacent to the, a, to the M77. People from Ayrshire have worked in Glasgow area for many years, me, me included, and so these investments shouldn't be seen in isolation, serving only those who live within the region and city deal areas. These deals will certainly assist the local communities directly, but they also open up opportunities for many others who choose to work in those areas. The same I'm, can be sh I'm, say, I'm sure can be said for all of these deals for the benefits spread further afield if we are careful about how we design them. And so to Ayrshire itself, where I've been happy to live for, for the past 60 years of my life, already highlighted by my colleague Kenny Gibson and a number of other members, we've been waiting a good few years now for our deal to be agreed. Some of us who have been in the Parliament for some time, especially since 2009 when Diageo announced to leave in Kilmarnock, have been pressing for an assistance package for Kilmarnock and the surrounding area and for Ayrshire as a whole since then. The Scottish Government has made its intentions clear for some time that it will back the Ayrshire deal and is ready to go. And if, as we hope, we get an announcement this week from the UK Government, it will provide a huge boost for Ayrshire and will kick-start the preparations for a host of wonderful projects that we hope will transform the economy and offer our citizens the same opportunities as those elsewhere in Scotland. Not only that, the spin-off benefits apply both ways to, as I mentioned earlier. So I think it's important to recognise this. Some of the wonderful projects that are in the pipeline, or could be in the pipeline, include the Moorfield Engineering Park that will expand that location for business space supporting advanced manufacturing. There will be assistance to develop smart manufacturing and digital skills via the Ayrshire Manufacturing an investment corridor, including an innovation centre in partnership with Strathclyde University, and the energy research project to explore how to produce localised energy generation and distribution. And the one that could absolutely transform our local area is called the HALO project in Kilmarnock itself. HALO was conceived by Marie Macklin shortly after, after the Diageo decision to take Johnny Walker out of Kilmarnock. And she's worked hard since then with both governments, with the AGO and the Council for several years now, to try and bring this incredible project to life. It will create a dynamic commercial, educational, cultural and leisure quarter in the town on that side beside the New Ayrshire College. And it itself could stimulate up to 1,500 new jobs. Its, a, its focal point will be an enterprise and innovation hub to stimulate digital learning, inspire creative thinking and to produce the kind of environment that will foster new starts and spin out businesses. It will have state-of-the-art live and work studios or rock cribs where entre entrepreneurs can live while growing their businesses. There will be a fashion foundry for small businesses to design and produce retail fashion wear and a digital retail shopping boutique. Supporting leisure, it will have a wave surface water feature built to Olympic standards and it will have Scotland's first virtual reality arcade with a cafe bar, digital retailing, graffiti art walls and exhibition and conference space too. Powering all of it, presiding officer, will be a low carbon energy scheme, a first for the UK. It already has some financial backing from the Scottish Government of about £5 million, £3.5 million from the UK, as well as £2 million each from the Council and from Diageo, who always said they would support a new local scheme to help us recover from the loss of the Johnny Walker jobs, and they've been true to their word. If and when this comes off, presiding officer, it will be utterly transformational for the town and for Ayrshire. So, uh, I personally, I can't wait for the Ayrshire growth deal to get the go-ahead and hopefully, hopefully the UK's government is ready to back it this Friday on Burns Day. If not, I think they've got a bit of explaining to do. 
These growth deals offer so much hope for all our communities. But in Ayrshire, I hope colleagues will forgive me for saying that this level of support has been overdue for some time. We have to make a success of these wonderful proposals, and I'm sure that we will. After all, they're about people, aspiration, hope and determination, not just for Ayrshire, President Officer, but for Scotland as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Coffey. Uh, I now have a little time in hand, so uh, we move to closing speeches. Mr Rowley, closing for Labour, and give you eight minutes. Thank you, President Officer. In closing for Labour in the debate today, I would begin by restating what I think has been the key message from colleagues across the chamber. That is that city deals place great emphasis on innovation, growing the digital economy, involving stakeholders, investment in infrastructure, and the promotion of culture. Of themselves, these are without doubt worthwhile aims, and the funding of city, region, and regional growth deals is to be welcomed. However, I would also want to restate some of the concerns and issues that Labour has. As city regional deals uh, and other growth initiatives develop, we believe that there are questions to be asked as to how the public money involved in these projects is being spent. Much like the public money we spend on procurement, how can we make sure that it is not being handed out where exploitative working practices are happening? that the real living wage will be paid and there will be no use of zero-hour contracts. Likewise, there are questions to be asked about how transparent uh, in determining projects where the transparency is, whether communities are fully consulted, who is accountable for delivery, ensuring that investment from city deals is over and above existing investment and not simply to replace funding cuts and that all of Scotland benefits from growth deals. For example, many in Fife were surprised and disappointed that the Leave Mouth Rail Link had not been included in the regional deal covering Fife. The Chief Executive of Fife Council then confirmed that the Council officers had been advised by Scottish Government civil servants not to include it as it would not have got support. So that really raises the question, who is deciding what goes in the bids and who is having the final say on what bids are successful or not? And if we have a situation where councils have been advised beforehand not to put key infrastructure projects in, then, then that is hardly the best way to achieve what local people desire. The First Minister has described the Edinburgh and South East of Scotland deal, which includes six councils, including five, as an area of huge importance to the Scottish economy. The region contains over a quarter of Scotland's population and contributes £33 billion to the Scottish and UK economies. The massive economic and social possibilities from a rail link into Leavenmouth being overlooked is a bit baffling, I have to say. It was a point made by the Local Government Committee report last year when they said there was a lack of engagement with local businesses, charities, etc. at the outset of deals and lack of information as to why certain projects are chosen. Good practice exists, but this needs to be shared more widely, was their view. The committee also raised a very important issue when they asked how do city regional deals align with other Scottish and UK government policies? For example, the Scottish Government is implementing the findings of the Enterprise and Skills Review and the UK Government has published its industrial strategy. How do city regional deals fit with these other policy priorities? The Royal Town Planning Institute makes a similar point when they say to unlock the transformational change required, integration and alignment with other national and regional strategies will be essential. They list 11 strategies in the brief that they've provided for today's debate. But as we know, there are many, many more strategies that the Scottish Government have developed. And how do they all fit together? 
or do they not, and is it simply strategy for strategy's sake with no real outcome? I know the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure has led this debate today, but the city deals have to be about more than building things, and indeed, if they are to succeed, then they will need to be driven by local government and local council's partners. And as many will be aware, wealth and achievement is not universal across the city regions. There are 22.4% of children living in poverty across the Edinburgh and South East Scotland region. With a growing housing crisis and too many people in poverty pay low -skill skilled jobs, it is clear the greatest benefit of investment will be to address and tackle these issues. It is essential that at its core, these deals not only focus on the acceleration of economic growth, but primarily create new economic opportunities, new skills, skilled, uh, well-paid, sustainable jobs, and most importantly, reduce inequality in our communities. There must be a skill strategy that aims to support people and giving them the opportunities to achieve the skills they need to succeed. We need a highly skilled workforce to achieve a high-skilled, high-waged economy. And that is a serious uh, proposition that the Scottish Government needs to acknowledge. What is our ambition for Scotland? Is it a high-skilled, high-waged economy? And where do city deals and other strategies fit to create that economy? The Scottish Secretary David Mundell said when the Stirling and Clackmannanshire City Region deal was signed, the ambitions and innovative deal will drive economic growth across the region, creating jobs and boosting prosperity for generations to come. He went on, it is now for Stirling and Clackmannanshire to get on with the hard work needed to turn these proposals into a reality. Well, the reality for Clark Manninshire Council is it's on the brink of collapse because of financial cuts. My question would be, how are councils to do the hard work against a background of Scottish Government centralisation, Westminster austerity, and ring fencing of budgets, the growth in regional governance, cut in local government finance, and the lack of local accountability for the delivery of city deals across Scotland. Many of Scotland's communities are under pressure from growth in poverty, cuts in public services, cost off in access to transport, poor housing, degraded environments. Local councils are on the front line of promoting and providing fair and inclusive services trying to tackle these big issues that are in communities. Without that support, too many communities and individuals are at risk of being left behind. Infrastructure and economic development need staff to work with developers, investors, employers. It needs to be driven at the local authority level. And some of the staff cuts we've seen in some of these key services in recent years reduces the ability of councils to be able to drive economic development and planning. So the capacity of councils to support and deliver will have a direct impact on the achievements of the aims set out in the city deals. Uh, and there you must conclude. And on that line, presiding officer, thank I you. thank you. I now call Rachel Hamilton to close for the Conservatives. Ten minutes, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. In closing for the Scottish Conservatives and considering all the contributions made today across the chamber, we can all agree that when the Scottish Government and the UK Government work together, great things can be achieved. City and regional deals, deals are vitally important for securing that long-term and sustained investment across Scotland. They unlock the potential to generate jobs and drive local and national economies. And investment in Scotland primarily focuses unfairly on the central belt and city deals and regional economic partnerships provide a conduit for driving some of the investment elsewhere and really giving other parts of Scotland more of a fighting chance at putting themselves on the map, attracting more businesses and realising potentials. Members today spoke of inequalities in education and health, infrastructure 
and uh, in our um, investment in roads. And our constituents, see, our constituents have high expectations of um, the City Deal investments. They want to see new jobs, better broadband and measures to tackle traffic congestion, as some of the Labour members talked about today. The City Deals, as we know, were first announced by the UK Government in 2011 and are part of a UK government industrial strategy with a long-term uh, project to boost productivity and earning power by building on the strengths that we have here in Scotland. However, as we've heard today, this has not all been plain sailing and the Local Government and Communities Committee conducted this inquiry into city deals and some of the points I want to um, make have been expressed by the members and they have concerns about rural areas um, being doubly disadvantaged by city region deals. They concluded that there are likely to be parts of the country that fall outside uh, the geographic boundaries of the deal um, in question or in certain parts of the area covered by the same deal. The board is an example of this where due to its proximity to Edinburgh it was technically included in parts of a particular city deal, but only saw limited investment for specific projects that not all constituents were happy with. Um, some members spoke of the negative points, as I said, of the city deals. Andy Whiteman criticised a closed-door negotiation policy and calls for increased transparency in the future evaluation of projects in the city-region deals. And Shona Robeson asked for more cash. Instead of welcoming the £1 billion pound funding from the UK government, she chose to complain. And 40 million of the 50 million of the extra funding from the Scottish Government is being put towards the Tay City deal, which will be spent on the Cross Tay link. Presiding officer, this road project was already planned. And may I gently remind Shona Robson that the people of Scotland are best served when its two governments engage in a collaborative manner. And listening to Bill Beaumont's calls for action and not words and collaboration and not grievance. And despite um, the SNP motion missing a significant point about the UK investment of over £1 billion, these benches remain positive and welcome the Secretary of State's announcement that the head of the terms on the Borderlands growth deal will be signed towards the end of May. And again, good pro progress has been made. And we now call on the Scottish Government to progress on the Scottish side of the deal. And my colleagues Finlay Carson and Oliver Mundell and I stand ready to support the delivery and the su successful delivery of Borderlands. We also welcome the significant progress of the Ayrshire growth deal, which Brian Whittle congratulated everyone on their persistence and hard work getting this over the line. Uh, Joanne Lamon and Neil Bibby, they want to see transformational delivery, not a make-do and mend approach. Projects for new roads, bridges need to be delivered and they call on the Scottish Government not to delay on those infrastructure projects. Closer to home, Finlay Carson talked about the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal and this transformative deal remit um, spans across 10% of the UK landmass encompassing the Scottish borders, Dumfries and Galloway, Carlisle, Cumbria and Northumberland. Borderlands would bring much needed investment to a geographically important area of the UK and the region is perfectly situated between urban co conurbations of the Central Belt and the North of England. In fact, 14 million people are within two hours drive of the region and the untapped potential that comes with this is enormous. And the UK uh, Conservative 2000 manifesto committed to this growth deal and then again in the autumn budget of 2017. Um, and, and we know that this, um, this borderlands uh, economic benefit will straddle both the English and the Scottish side of the borders encompassing those uh, five local uh, authorities. Um, we were pleased that the plans were submitted in October last year and I welcome the commitment from the Scottish Government on Borderlands. I want to reiterate the point from the beginning, it is collaborative working of both governments that uh, really does deliver results. So I'm um, also glad that the feasibility for extending the Borders Railway from Carlisle to Tweed Bank is included and this would, again, as many members here today mentioned about their own uh, infrastructure projects in their own regions and um, be transformational um, and it would open up parts of the region which otherwise would continue to rely on uh, road infrastructure which in some circumstances requires so, um, substantial upgrading. So today I also want to mention those rural areas um, that uh, otherwise get missed and again 
um, I apologise for mentioning my own constituency in this, but I, um, I know the country, and, and it's areas like the Ettrick Valley and Teviotdale and Hoyke, um, the constituents constantly write to me about genuinely being missed out on opportunities and jobs and investment and uh, tourism. Um, another, another project of great worth is the improvement in broadband provision and speeds. And just this morning, we see the latest figures from the WITCH report, which showed unsurprisingly that um, the Borders has the 10th slowest broadband out of 358 local authorities um, across the whole UK. And the allocation of 200 million to pilot innovative approaches to rolling out full fibre broadband in rural locations will some, go some way in improving the often patchy and unreliable broadband experience in the Borders. And I'm sure many uh, of the um, uh, many members here today um, will agree with that. Um, presiding officer. I will. Stuart McMillan. I thank Rachel Hamilton for taking the intervention. And on that spirit of uh, cooperation that she was talking about earlier on, would she then agree with me that the UK government should actually increase its expenditure into the broadband scheme? Rachel Hamilton. Um, I, I actually, what, what I would say to um, Stuart McMillan is uh, I would say that the uh, Scottish Government have very, been very slow in rolling out the delivery. The money was allocated from the UK Government years ago, but that money wasn't spent. I doubt that you will be able to deliver the broadband by 2021, and I set you that challenge, Mr McMillan. Uh, presiding officer, um, we've, we've heard uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, support for the, the deal today and the d city deals, but um, I think sometimes that the Scottish Government and uh, the, the members here today uh, are in a desperate attempt to stoke grievance. I, I, I do advise that they perhaps would seek seek teamwork and collaboration. But in closing for these benches, um, city deals and regional economic partnerships, we know they bring prosperity and investment to the areas which, due to their geographical location, would otherwise be lost out. We support both the, the um, Scottish Government and the UK Government in delivering, delivering um, these city region deals and support the campaign for every part of Scotland to be covered and benefit from the growth deal. I look forward to seeing both my own Borderlands Growth deal evolve and the other city deals and, and the islands um, deal too and hope that they come to fruition in the near future. And presiding officer, um, there is a lot of potential out there and, and these deals, we know, they help to unlock that. And let's see the next round continue uh, the good work that we've seen to date. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just with the avoidance of doubt, I say that Mr Whiteman had the uh, permission of the presiding officers, uh, gave advance notice not to be present for closing speeches, saw a couple of frowns and a couple of faces. That sets the record straight. Uh, I now call Jamie Hepburn to close for the government minister till five o'clock. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Can I uh, begin by thanking those members who have taken part in today's debate on what I believe is a subject of central importance to growing uh, Scotland's economy. Jamie Green at the outset said he hoped that uh, this uh, Scottish Government is approaching this issue on a, a constructive basis. Well, let me assure Mr Green that, of course, we approach this on the same constructive basis that we approach each and every issue we are uh, discharged with responsibility for. That said, in relation to his uh, amendment. Uh, I can say we will not be supporting uh, the amendment that he has presented uh, today, not because there is anything uh, fundamentally or inherently wrong with the terms that it has, it has uh, set out, but I do uh, believe that it is important that this Parliament sends a very clear message to the UK Government that it is our expectation in the spirit of uh, partnership that the UK Government should it match the level of investment that the Scottish Government is investing in city, region and uh, uh, regional growth uh, deals, which they have failed to do so uh, thus far. I thought Alistair Allen uh, made a very uh, telling point that he said that what is, seems to be driving this is uh, the Treasury's insistence on expenditure delineation along devolved and reserved functions. This comes at the same time that the Scottish Government is uh, spending on the mitigation of the impact of changes to social security and on delivery of broadband, let me, which are of course both reserved areas. And let me say on the latter point uh, to Rachel Hamilton, we will 
meet our commitments in relation to the R100 uh, programme with the investment of some £600 million, of which only £21 million is being delivered by the UK government. But in a minute, I will. Uh, but let me say, uh, in relation to the investment that we are making in reserved areas, I heard Jamie Green say from a sedentary position, so it may not have been picked up for the official uh, report, but I'm sure he was confirmed he said this. He said that it was our political choice to do so. And I accept that entirely. But he either must accept and concede that as a UK, the UK government's decision not to provide equivalent funding to city, region and growth deals is a political choice to one that I regret and one that I hope they will revisit. And of course, I'll give way to Mr Carson. Uh, Finlay Carson, please. Intervention. Could the Minister confirm whether the, the government are on track to deliver the roadmap with timings for the rollout of R100 in July is committed to? Minister. It will, uh, much of this is out to procurement just now, but let me make the fundamental point. We will hit the targets we have uh, set ourselves. Uh, city, uh, region and, and other growth deals and the, the regional economic partnerships, they are uh, inspiring. Uh, President of Sarar, of course, uh, new, but I uh, believe that there is a recognition of uh, their potential in accelerating economic growth in a way which will drive both prosperity and uh, societal equity. The Scottish Government is committed to these uh, arrangements. Uh, since 2014, we've committed almost £1.3 billion to city region deals across Scotland. We've uh, seen uh, deals for all of Scotland's city regions now uh, agreed or reached the stage of a ahead of terms uh, agreement and that these deals are uh, providing the catalyst for the development of new regional economic partnerships, uh, bringing together partners to maximise uh, all assets and opportunities uh, for uh, their uh, regions, creating new cross-boundary ways of collaborating and maximising opportunities on terms agreed by local uh, partners. Uh, as I've mentioned, city region deals are a relatively new part of the economic development landscape. Uh, that was uh, mentioned by a few uh, members. Andy Whiteman mentioned that Audit Scotland will shortly be undertaking a, a review into uh, what has been put in place so far. I, I welcome them uh, looking at city region deals. Uh, at Colin Smith, Andy Whiteman, Jenny Gilruth, Alec Rowley uh, suggested that communities need to be involved more in deal partnerships. Uh, I would uh, say that it is, of course, of fundamental importance that communities are involved in uh, the, uh, 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 the creation and the design of uh, such uh, deals. It should be a transparent process, and our democratically elected local authorities should seek to engage uh, with their communities and ensure meaningful connection between uh, communities and uh, this uh, process going forward. Colin Smith and others spoke about trying to establish a clear timetable for the agreement of heads of terms for those deals that are under negotiation. And I'm very happy to say in response to what was set out a moment ago by Rachel Hamilton that the Cabinet Secretary will meet the Secretary of State for Scotland next week. And we look forward to his confirmation that the timescale she has set out for heads of terms it will be uh, what the UK government sets uh, out. There have, of course, been challenges, uh, uh, some challenges in getting uh, over the line with the Borderlands deal. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary laid that out. Of course, much of this is out with our gift because it relates to investment the UK government must uh, make through local authorities in England. I don't think anyone, any reasonable person would expect that the Scottish Government uh, delivers uh, that element of the deal. But, of course, we want to see uh, progress. And if the timescale is, as Rachel Hamilton has set out, then that uh, will be uh, welcome. Ayrshire, it was mentioned. Uh, the three local authorities have been very clear that they are ready yeah. to sign heads of terms this Friday, this week, this Friday, Thursday, Burns night. We have written to the UK Government to make very clear, abundantly clear, that we are ready to operate to that time scale as well. Thus far, the reply from the UK government, we have had none. So let me send this very clear uh, message to the UK government here and now. We remain ready and willing and good to go for this Friday. And if the UK government are listening, 
I hope to see them in Ayrshire on Friday to sign that uh, deal. Of course. Brian, Brian Whittle. As uh, I mentioned in my speech, I spoke to David Mundell on Friday and he says that the signing is imminent and that the, 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 treasury, their treasury, the treasury have committed to that project. But in the spirit of collaboration, as you well know, within in growth deals, there are some devolved, uh, uh, devolved projects as well as retained projects and joint projects. So it's well within the Scottish Government's uh, ability to commit to uh, devolved projects. Is there nothing there within that there that you could actually sign? Because when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter to me or to the people of Ayrshire whether you lead or whether the British Government lead. It just needs somebody to take the, take the initiative. Well, Minister. let me say, I think we still lack some significant clarity on the timescale for signing the heads of terms for this deal. Yes, of course, there are investments that we can leverage, and we've set out very clearly the investment we'll make in the HALO project that was mentioned by Willie Coffey. But in terms of what we debate today, we need a specific timescale, not some uh, measurement on the basis of it being imminent. We are ready to go this Friday. The UK government should be ready to go. The local authorities are ready to go. And I hope the imminence that Brian Whittle speaks of is as imminent as has just been set out. Uh, there was also a, a, a request from Mr Smith around a, a timescale for those areas that, uh, are not yet, uh, have a, that do not yet have any commitment from the UK Government for a deal uh, at all. Argyll, Butte, Falkirk and the Islands with the best will in the world. If the UK Government have not yet committed to a deal at all, it is somewhat difficult for this Scottish Government to be able to commit to a specific uh, timescale. But let me say to all members, particularly those who represent uh, those parts of the country, that they can be assured of the Scottish Government's commitment to all areas of uh, Scotland. Uh, Bill Bowman uh, said he was unclear on the Scottish Government's investment in the Tay City uh, region deal. Let me make very clear that we have said we'll invest £150 million in the deal. Some of the specific areas are £25 million in the Tayside Biomedical Cluster, £37 million in Culture and Tourism, £20 million in the Regional Skills and Employability Programme, investment that Shona Robinson was welcoming, and now that he's more acquainted with the detail, I look forward to Mr Bowman welcoming as well. A number of members mentioned the situation with Glasgow Airport. Let me uh, be very clear, the Scottish Government is committed to working uh, with those involved in the airport access uh, project to find a solution to improve uh, surface access to uh, the airport. Uh, Jan Lamont uh, wanted to know that there was proper engagement. I can uh, give her that insurance. Transport Scotland and Network Rail are continuing uh, to work uh, with uh, the airport access uh, project uh, team. Uh, and indeed, the Cabinet Secretary will chair the next meeting of the steering group, which includes leaders of both Glasgow and Renfrewshire Council, as well as Glasgow Airport. Uh, Joanne Lamont says that might not be good enough, but throughout the debate, we've heard a call for collaboration and cooperation. And I think the process that's been taken forward is a sensible one. And I can see or hear that Ms Lamont is keen to intervene. I'm happy to allow that. Joanne Lamont. You have mentioned, in relation to other projects, the importance of clarity of timescale. Will you confirm that the Scottish Government is committed to the surface project as outlined in the business deal supported by the finance that is there? And will you give us a timescale for the delivery of that project, not just engagement, but delivery of a project that not just Glasgow needs, but the West of Scotland and Scotland as a whole? Jamie Hepburn. The time, the time scales I have talking, uh, I've spoken about have been precisely about the process of engagement. We need a clear time scale from the UK government to engage so we can get the city deals forward. And the process I've laid out in relation to the uh, area that Ms Lamont is interested in is, I believe, uh, the uh, correct one. Uh, Jenny Gilruth and Alec Rowley spoke about another uh, rail link, this time for uh, Leavenmouth. What I will, uh, of course, say is that uh, city region deals play a, a hugely important role. They're not the sole source of investment. Uh, of course, Transport Scotland is uh, working with Fife Council on uh, the Leaving Mouth Sustainable Transport uh, study. Uh, I know that there is uh, stakeholder engagement. That will uh, continue. A preliminary options appraisal is underway. And I know the Cabinet Secretary is due to meet Ms Gilruth as the local constituency representative on this issue uh, tomorrow to discuss 
uh, further. Uh, let me uh, draw my remarks to a, a close, uh, presiding officer, because what I want to set out is that through uh, the city region deals, through uh, the uh, area growth deals that we have put in place, that we're presently negotiating, that we want to see put in place, we are seeing a significant difference made to the country as a whole. And it must be for the country as a whole. Jamie, take, I go back to Jamie Green's remarks about a desire for constructive working. Over the past four years, we have worked with the UK government in partnership on city region deals. And most challenging, this partnership has delivered results. However, the time now is right to continue to press UK ministers to match our investment. I believe that's something this parliament must do. And also to press UK ministers to confirm the time to give for the heads of terms for Ayrshire and to join us in common purpose by making a formal commitment to 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals. I believe the people of Scotland would expect nothing less and I hope the parliament unites this evening to that purpose. Thank you very much, and that concludes uh, this afternoon's debate, and we're going to go straight to decision time. The first question this afternoon is that amendment 15493.2 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend motion 15493 in the name of Michael Matheson, on a city deal and regional economic partnership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15493.2 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 28, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is the amendment 15493.1 in the name of Colin Smith, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Michael Matheson be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15493 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended on a city deal and regional economic partnership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15493 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended is yes 80, no 33, there were no abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly now to members' business in the name of Monica Lennon on cervical screening uptake statistics. But we'll just take a few moments for uh, members and for the minister to change seats.